Good evening. Good evening, everybody. If we could grab a seat so we get the show on the road. I'd like to call the order of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District Board meeting for Wednesday, February 26, 2020. And I would like to ask Trustee DeSerpa if she could lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Also, I'd like to say we have a translation in Spanish. If you need support, please see Virginia, who's located over here. Um, we would also, I'd also like to say that if someone would like to speak to an agenda, uh, item on the agenda, they must complete a speaker card and then hand to Eva, who's over here, prior to the agenda item. Each speaker will have two minutes. So with that, uh, agenda item 3.3, .3, the superintendent comments by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. So on February 14th, um, Valentine's Day, I had the pleasure to spend a day in the life of a Duncan Holbert preschool teacher and our, and our fantastic teacher, Amy Lauta. So el 14 de febrero tuve el placer de pasar un día en la vida de una maestra preescolar de Duncan Holbert um, con nuestra fantástica maestra Amy Lauta. Um, she was so caring, compassionate, energetic with her students and her staff throughout the day. de asistencia. Alcanzar este objetivo nos afecta a todo ser personal, a certificado, clasificado y administración. El, pas el pasado fin de semana, más de 1,300 estudiantes asistieron a la academia de sábado en nueve escuelas diferentes. So site and district administration are finding creative ways to engage the students. At Rolling Hills Middle School, the assistant principal, Selene Munoz, held a Saturday Academy with 140 students using herself, Police Assistance League PAL, and high school volunteers. So administración escolar y el distrito han encontrado formas creativas para involucrar a los estudiantes. En la escuela secundaria de Rolling Hills, la subdirectora Selene Muñoz, con el apoyo de la Liga de Asistencia de Policía y voluntarios de las escuelas preparatorias, llevó a cabo una academia de sábado al cual asistieron 140 estudiantes. Starting March 7th, we will begin district-wide Saturday field trips to Monterey Bay Aquarium for our students. We are asking all district administrators to chaperone at least one field trip, so all of them that are out there. I will be chaperoning the first one on March 7th and the second one on March 21st. A partir de 7 de marzo, comenzamos excursiones de sábados en todo el distrito adecuario de Monterrey para nuestros estudiantes. Estamos pidiendo que todos los administradores de la oficina de distrito que pueden supervisar una excursión a las uh, supervisar una excursión. Yo voy a ayudar a la supervisión de la primera viaje el 7 de marzo y también el 21 de marzo. So thank you. Um, agenda item 3.4, governing board comments, reports on standing committee meetings. This is the opportunity for each board member to make a few comments, and I would like to start with Trustee Georgia Acosta. 
I'll waive tonight. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Trustee Maria Ruskell. Thank you, Danny. So um, my comments tonight will be brief as well. So I got the opportunity to participate as a judge at the Watson Moore Charter School of the Arts Invention Convention. All I can say is that I was super impressed and inspired by our young inventors. So great job, chameleons. I also attended the DLAC LCAP input session. And it was great to just listen to our parent leaders' concerns and feedback in regards to our LCAP goals. And as always, I left the room with a couple of action items they asked me to address. Um, so thank you for voicing your concerns. And lastly, although I wasn't able to attend um, this year's parent conference as it conflicted with my baby's baptism, I do want to congratulate Ruby Vasquez and her team on a job well done. Also, a huge thank you to Migrant Ed uh, for supporting the conference by providing bus transportation. I know that means the world to our families. Thank you. Thank you very much. Trustee Osmondson. <clears throat> I did screw up on the DLAC meeting, <laughs> but um, I went to the Adult Education Advisor Advisory Council, and it was so incredibly cool to see all the stuff that they have, like the jobs that they are creating for their, their our community. For example, they um, they've always been wanting to do um, nursing assistant. Um, the position of nursing assistant, but they haven't been able to find a teacher because the teacher has to have worked in a convalescent hospital. So it's been very difficult to find a teacher, but they found one. <laughs> so they're starting, um, um, so people can become a nursing assistant with adult education. And they've also got a dental assistant, a pharmacy assistant, a tech, and a medical assistant, all of those there too. And they actually are starting a, um, a let's see, I, it's almost like a pre-apprenticeship program um, with, where they're able to have, you know, a, their, you know, students in adult education do um, construction, um, elect plumbing, electricity, and it's funny because I think Nancy Billis says that some of them are getting certificates and going right out to work instead of finish f doing the whole apprenticeship program because they're you know they got certificates in their pre-apprenticeship program so they're they're actually doing well going out and getting positions so that that was great I love all the stuff that adult education does and um, I went to the migrant um, migrant Head Start meeting and they have a policy committee which is not the full committee of about thirty. 30 um, parents. This one's during the year, not during their migrant season. It's called the executive committee. And so there's, um, I think, five executive members that come to a meeting, and myself. And it was great because um, one of the staff members came and talked about their curriculum. They have what they call creative curriculum. And she talked about all the themes every month. And I was going to bring it to you, but I forgot to bring um, all these fabulous great themes er every month that they're doing with their children it's super great um i went to the parent conference and it was super great i didn't go to the whole day conference because unfortunately i have to work on sundays even in solar um, but i was there for the beginning of it um, and it was so great to see everybody and um, they had a whole program at the beginning you know for me to go to it was, it was really great and then I only thing else I did I went to my um, my teacher friend Marta Flores from EA Hall invited me to a fundraiser for special education um, at EA Hall at Cassidy's and I guess Cassidy she says does a lot of work for the school district pr providing you know fundraisers for school districts so it's that's cool um, so I went to her fundraiser. And yeah, that was good too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you. Um, in the essence of saving time, I will pass tonight. I'm looking forward to hearing from everyone here. We have a couple of special guests tonight that we'll hear from, and I'm excited about that. Um, there is a teacher recruitment fair March 7th at the COE. 
that um, Pajaro Valley will be participating in, and I encourage um, anybody who's interested in teaching for Pajaro Valley to come to that event. Thank you. I, I will also will pass to Trustee Dahl. I attended the Chain of Kindness event at Minty White Elementary, and it was lovely to see all of the acts of kindness that the students had um, created and made into a link. It was a pile of you know, links, probably, I don't know, waist high for me, which is considerable if you know how tall I am. Um, I also attended the parent conference at EA Hall. I thought it was incredibly well organized, and I appreciated seeing that barriers such as childcare and transportation were managed so that we could have robust attendance. And one session in particular stood out for me, and that was one I attended with uh, President Dodge, and it was on how the district is supporting our English language learners. And for me, even though I get information about our programs as a trustee, it was wonderful to sit in a group you know, with different stakeholders and hear about experiences and learn a little bit, have a deeper conversation about our programs. So I really appreciated that. I also attended uh, today's wellness committee meeting and a particular aspect of the meeting that stood out to me was looking for opportunities for healthy ways to reward our students. So things like having popcorn parties, maybe instead of like cupcake parties or you know, having maybe extra time at recess. And I'm curious about that. So I am curious about hearing like what are alternatives that people are using. So I'm interested in that. That's it. Um, I just wanted to read a brief comment from Trustee uh, Satcher who's not here today. Uh, she wrote, um, she's sorry to miss tonight's meeting. She is out of town as stated at the December 2019 organizational meeting. She will be back next meeting. So thanks. Um, Next off, agenda item 3.5, high school student board representative report. And I believe so far we have new school, just new school. Are they here? Oh. I'm not sure. Oh. Okay. Um. Okay. All right. Well, since no one, uh, another high school here, no other representatives? Okay. All right. All right. Moving on, um, next off we have item 3.6, the Carlston Family Foundation. Report will be presented by Timothy Allen, director of the foundation. Dr. Rodriguez and board members, I'm very proud to introduce Tim Allen from the Carlston Family Foundation, who identified one of our PVUSD Watsonville High Teachers for an outstanding award. Thank you very much. It is truly an honor to be here. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our foundation first. The foundation was started by a company called Broderbund Software. The two Carlston brothers and a sister started that in the late 80s. And it was an educational games uh, computer-based program. If you remember, where in the world are you? Carmen San Diego and Print Shop. Those were the first uh, things that they began to produce. When they started the company, they also started a 501c3 that they funded with a, a percentage of their profits. And they asked their employees to go out in the Bay Area and volunteer their time for a charity of choice and they could come back and get grants uh, for their uh, volunteer work. In the late 80s, they went through a hostile takeover. They lost the company, sold the company, but they were able to retain the endowment <clears throat> that they had created over the years. So the family got together and said, what are we going to do with this money? And because several of the people in the family had been teachers, mostly in higher education, they said, let's focus on high school teachers in California. And then they made some really interesting considerations about how to award teachers. The first thing that they decided was that in order for a teacher to be considered for an award that they were going to give, they had to be nominated by former students. And they had to be nominated by former students who were either enrolled in or graduated from a four-year university. The second thing they said was that these teachers had to teach in high-need, highly culturally diverse schools, mostly Title I schools. The idea being that if these teachers could take kids who are basically first-generation high school students, give them the skills necessary to compete in higher education, then they probably were doing a very good job. And so back in, in 2000, 
this organization started off, and since that time we have honored now with this past year uh, 87 teachers. Now once a nomination comes in from one of these students, and this is what makes us, I think, different from any Teacher of the Year program, is that once a nomination comes in, my job is to find six or seven other former students who span the career of this teacher from as far back as I can go. And of course, I want to get somebody from the last year, the last year's graduating class, because I want to know if the teacher's energy and passion is still there since the time that they started teaching until last year. And so after interviewing five or six or seven of those students, I interview the principal, I interview two colleagues, I interview the teacher, and by then I know more about the teacher than he or she knows about themselves. <laughs> and then I go out and watch them teach. And out of the group, probably 100 nominations that I get every year, I narrow it down to 15 that go that to that length, and I give the board finally 10 candidates. The board selects five of those and gives each of them $20,000. <laughs> this year, uh, as every year, we have our award ceremony in Mill Valley, up in the Bay Area, Northern Bay, Bay Area, and we had the opportunity to honor one of your teachers. Actually, this is the second teacher from Watsonville High School. Several years ago, we honored Grace Patino, mm -hmm. and it's unusual that we get two people from the same high school. But this year, we have the pleasure of honoring uh, Ms. Matafian. And at the award ceremony, she received her personal check for 15000 which she gets an opportunity to decide how she's or to spend on her own. But we hold back $5,000, and we give that $5,000 as a grant to the high school. And Grace, uh, not Grace, I'm sorry, Vivian, <laughs> gets the opportunity to determine where that money goes. But I have to tell you that when I talked to Vivian's former students, I got a virtual education in what makes effective teachers. I interview probably 300 to 400 young people every year about what it takes to make great teachers effective in their classroom, why they are able to change the pathways of students. And the things that I heard about Vivian basically is that she has a passion for what she does. She really, truly enjoys coming to the classroom every day. And you can see her energy, and you can see how she relates to her students, because the kids told me there is no, obstac no obstacle in that classroom that she's going to allow us to stand behind. We are going to be successful. Failure is not an option in her class. And when I walked into Grace's class, I'm sorry, I keep calling. <laughs> When I, when I walked into Vivian's classroom, I saw that in action. I saw how she related to her students. I saw the love that they had and the respect that they had for her. I saw how she loved teaching them and how she had this unique ability to make very, very complicated things easy to understand, because I was no math student. And I could, at the end of the time that I spent with her, I actually understood a few things. So it is truly my pleasure and my honor to award this grant to Vivian and to Watsonville High School. Thank you so much. We enjoy it. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it is it is my honor. It's my honor to be a teacher, and I don't want to cry. And I must say, it's my honor to be a teacher. I, I'm grateful to um, to my colleagues, and to my administrators, um, to you for your service, and mostly to my students, my former students, um, some of whom are even here, and and um, and my current students. It is my great pleasure and honor to be a teacher, um, and. Uh, for the the five thousand um, dollars, I've I've talked. We wanted to do something that um, that would last, something that wouldn't just go away. And um, I have a great love of reading and and libraries. And so I spoke with our library 
um, media tech and said, what do you need? And uh, so we decided together that there's a, a place in Watsonville High School you probably know if you've been in the library that's behind the glass in area that is underutilized or maybe pretty much these days unutilized because Amy sits outside that office. And she says that uh, these days with all the computers and all the games happening and all the activity stuff that goes on in the library that we need a quiet place. So we're going to use remodel that spot that behind the glass in area and with furniture and lighting and desks that make it appealing for a quiet area in the library. And that's what we'll do with the $5,000. Thank you again so much. Thank you all. Thank you very much, and go Cats. Um, are, are there any public speakers to this item? Any comments or questions from the board? Mr. Allen, I just want to say on behalf of the board, thank you so much for honoring one of our own teachers. Well, you know, the, the beauty of it is that it, it could be any teacher in this room right. because it comes from their former students. It's... It's something that kids will walk into a college office and they'll see the form and they'll fill it out or they'll go online. So I'm sure that every school in every district has a lot of wonderful teachers, but it is because it's student oriented, it, it, it really makes so much more of a difference and we're proud to do that. How did the student find out about the Carlson Foundation? They find out about it in a variety of ways. Um, one of the things that I do every year is send out um, information to all the deans of the schools of education in all the colleges and universities in California because we would like that information passed out to their students because one of the reasons most of us went into teaching was because we had a teacher who made a difference. We go through the financial aid offices because we're looking for kids who have financial difficulty. So those forms are there, or the, the flyers are there. We posted in their school newspapers, the university dailies. We give it out to uh, a lot of the minority scholarship foundations. And then a lot of kids just go online and look for something. So that's basically how they come. And they come, sometimes I get over 150 and sometimes I only get 50. But they're all pretty good. So some, some students that are like getting, working on a master's degree or credential program also can apply to the foundation for grants? No, they, they can only nominate the teachers. Nomination, got it. Okay, well thank you. Oh, thank you're you welcome. Very much. My pleasure, thank you. Um, so any more comments, questions? No. Oh, trusting Hall. I just wanted, real quick, before you leave, I just wanted to acknowledge just the, the beautiful opportunity to give back in creating that quiet space, that having that, just a, a moment to just kind of sit and breathe or study and kind of shut out all of the literal noise is, is a beautiful thing. So thank you for continuing to, to pass on that gift. New school, are you here? New school representatives. Good evening, my name is Iris Ornelas. I'm a junior in New School. And hi, my name is Kimberly Lopez and I'm senior class president. So we had Spirit Week before we went on our winter break and the Spirit Days we had were Holiday Hat, Crazy Socks, PJ's Day, and Ugly Sweaters. We had the mayor visit, visit us because we wrote letters to him on if we were mayors. 
he brought pizza and had lunch with us. <laughs> Students had interesting conversations with him. Um, for basketball, we had two. We have two teams, one for boys and one for co-ed. Both teams will be competing this Friday against Renaissance to decide who will play Central Coast for the league championship. On January 22nd, Josh Lopez and Lupita Gonzalez were students of the month, and on February 12th, Luis Gomez and Leti Juarez were students of the month, and Josh Lopez won the, the speech contest today at the Rotary Club. In the role model um, conference, Latino role model conference, six students attended. Um, they heard inspirational local professionals and families. Um, there was a keynote speaker, uh, Reina Grande. On World, on World Wetlands Day, six of our students attended. We planted trees and native plants. There was live music. We met the congressman, J Jimmy Panetta, and we got free passes to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. For student night conferences, we provided food and parents attended as well. Our slides contained our credits, attendance, map scores, and growth. Um, Watsonville Rotary gave us a $2,000 grant. Um, with the money, we are going to be making a water bottle greenhouse, a minion recycling sculpture, a garden to garden design, and a side yard, a side yard redesign, and a gravity drip irrigation system. For New School Fridays, we had, digital, we had digitalness, science workshop, and sports. Now we have mariposa art, which include dance, ceramics, and calligraphy. We attended the community arts empowerment, where students are working on a mosaic project that will go on the parking garage in Watsonville. That's it. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other high schools, or is that it? OK. Um, next up, approval of agenda. Agenda item 4.1. I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda with an amendment to move item 8.1 up to um, after item 5.1, the approval of the minutes. Can second I? that motion. Okay. All right. So I, I got a first and a second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. Um, agenda item number five, approval of minutes. 5.1, approval of February 12th, 2020 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? Move approval. Second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay. Okay. So we have 601, I believe. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I approved the minutes. So next up, we're moving to item 8.1, the Pajaro Valley Little League and E Hall School Joint Facility Use Agreement. Report will be presented by Joe Dominguez. Uh, good evening, Board President uh, Dodge Jr. Uh, and members of the Board, Superintendent Rodriguez. We have uh, this evening pleased to present um, with Pajaro Valley uh, Little League uh, a joint facility use agreement, uh, which provides a five-year term in partnership with uh, PVUSD. Uh, for the EA Hall softball and baseball field. Uh, it's a true uh, partnership and it benefits our youth in our community. Uh, the agreement allows uh, Pajaro uh, Valley Little League to use our facility after school hours um, from 4.30 uh, to sundown. And it also uh, provides the district with the, uh, maintains the right and authority to uh, continue facility use permits to other nonprofits or sports leagues uh, when it's not conflicting with the school district or school site calendar and or uh, Pajaro Valley uh, Little League calendar. It also, um, in the agreement, we waive our facility use permits to the Little League. In exchange, they will provide uh, maintenance and upkeep of the fields, and uh, including the snack shack. Um, and moving forward they are uh, planning if the agreement is approved to uh, install um, at a future date a batting cage for our youth uh, to have practice 
and also um, storage containers both for athletic equipment and for maintenance equipment for the upkeep of the field. Um, so it's our recommendation to uh, move forward with the agreement. And this evening we also have uh, Pajaro Valley Little League joining us tonight. Um, and I'm open for any questions. Do we need public speakers tonight? Okay. We have several public speakers, so I'll call you up in groups of three if you can line up at the podium. Um, John Sapaios. Sapaios. Um, Shane Osborne and Aurelio Gonzalez. Uh, good evening, uh, trustees. Thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you for uh, cooperating with us. Can I bring up uh, our president, Rick Stubblefield, uh, so that way we can go ahead into this. Oh, that's our clicker here. Um, I, I'm just going to give a quick uh, history uh, because I actually have behind me two presidents. I have one president that was a uh, president for Wattsville National Little League that uh, was originally there for when Wattsville National Little League existed and moved from Ramsey Park to EA Hall School. So Little League's been at EA Hall School since approximately 1998. And so our past president for that was John Savayos. And uh, I just want to introduce him to him and he could say a few words. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, Aurelio. As Aurelio mentioned, uh, I was the past president for about 12 years of the National Little League. Um, combined years with my kids from age 5 to 12, so I had three of those go through there, so 12, 24, 36, or something like that, right? So a lot of time there, um, a lot of cleanup at the EA Hall um, school and um, the uh, fields. Really was a part of this as well and uh, at that time, and we were playing interaction also with American League. Oh, and uh, South Cipuedes, which Rick Stubblefield was the president at that time of South Cipuedes. Um, but as Relio mentioned, uh, I started at Ramsey Park. Uh, we took um, the rubber, which is the pitching rubber, and we moved it to Franich Field when Franich opened up with its first field. Um, and, um, you know, we need this to support the kids um, because, as we all know, there's so much so much happening in, in today's world with the children um, and to have this support uh, from um, the district um, would be very very much appreciated and very well needed uh, to support the kids um, you know when you have a clean field uh, the kids are more um, adapt to coming out and wanting to play we don't have a great field and and balls are hopping all over the place on them and they you know are a little uh, tentative to play because the ball can hop, and if they're not prepared, you know it's gonna it's gonna get them good in the chest or something or or in in, in the face. So, um, you know, having those fields prepared, um, not only for the school but for the little league, um, we would really appreciate that, and it would go a long way. You know, as uh, I mentioned, I've been around little league all my life, and um, it was a great thing for my kids, and all the team building made them better men. Uh, so we create men, we create children, we create ladies, and um, even to this day, you know, I remember and still have um, players that I've coached through the whole time that I was there and see them out in the, in the public and they say, hey, coach, hi, John, how you doing? And, you know, we see each other and it's, it's a great thing to see them and have them remember uh, where they came from. So thank you very much and we look forward to your support. Just. Just a, just a little tidbit. I actually, I, I'm wearing this blue because I had to be uh, the Dodgers one year in National Little League. And uh, John's son was on my team. And John said, how dare you? Mm -hmm. um, so his son had always had to take the uniform off before he got in the car. I said, John, really? I, go, I know you're a Giants fan. But, but anyways, I'd like to bring up Rick Stubblefield. Uh, he's also been with South Sopoetis Little League. South Sopoetis Little League and Watsonville National Little League uh, joined forces. Uh, and so... And we're going to get to that. And so now he's also the president of the Pajaro Valley Little League. Thank you, really. I wasn't expecting to have to speak tonight, but uh, here I am. Um, been involved in Little League baseball in the Watsonville area since I was 15 years old. So I think I'm, that's, if I could still count right, that's going on 54 years this year. Uh, Little League is multi-generational in the community. I've been in uh, long enough where I'm seeing a lot of uh, 
tons of uh, sons of fathers that played and even grandsons where their grandpas played Little League in this area and their uh, dads played Little League area. I know we have a few people here in support tonight, dads and kids, if you could stand up just briefly. And thank you for coming and thank you for your support. I didn't, um, honestly, I didn't, uh, I didn't personally, I didn't push very hard for the dads to bring their kids out tonight only because it's a school night, you know, so not knowing where this was on the agenda and how late we'd be here, but, uh, but uh, so it means all that much more that they're here. Uh, we would uh, really be hurting bad without EA Hall, I'm telling you, because we have, right now we have, uh, we have uh, practice out of there, both fields, six days a week. And as difficult as the red tape can be to get other sites approved for practice, EA Hall is paramount to uh, our existence and being able to and being able to let the kids play in practice because we have, as every little league does, we have more teams than we do facilities to practice. So it would really be appreciated if uh, if the board could approve this extension of the MOU and we could keep on keeping on and look for improvements and maybe someday have a schedule of games out there. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, I'm going to bring you up a coach. It's Shannon, he's uh, he's Shane. I'm sorry about that. He's re he's really famous around town. He's coached basketball, football, soccer. He's a coach all the way around coach. But now we have him as a baseball coach. So yeah, that's what happens. Uh, that's what happens when you don't know how to say no. Um, I come at it from a different perspective than the other speakers. Um, I moved to Watsonville 15 years ago. Uh, my wife's family's been here. Um, I didn't have much of a sense for community. Um, I started coaching with my special needs nephew, with uh, Lisa Sandoval. And uh, I've been with the league for 11 years now. Um, it's a great community. I've made friends. My son has grown up in it. Um, you know, we serve two to 300 kids every year. Um, about 25 to 30% of those kids are on some form of scholarship. Um, if you're a parent of an aspiring athlete, I think you guys know how much that cost can be in nowadays with travel ball and all this stuff. Little League doesn't turn anybody away. So we have kids that, you know, maybe not, couldn't afford to go play some other sports, but they can always play Little League. Um, as uh, Rick said, these fields are vital to our continuation of, of, of baseball, which is, you know, a great American game, teaches a lot of life lessons. And um, hopefully I want to say thank you to EA Hall for getting this MUE ready to go and hopefully you guys approve it. Thanks. Well, I, thank you. Uh, I just want to wrap it up with uh, this. This is an important step that we're taking forward because uh, this is going to allow us to help maintain those fields, cut the grass, and make the game, the fields more playable for our children in the community. Um, so we hope that you guys support us in this in endeavor of ours, and uh, and you, you'll be supporting the kids also. Uh, I know not all the whole league came out. Uh, we didn't want to overwhelm you guys or the teachers because uh, they see enough of them as it is. Um, <laughs> but anyways, uh, so tonight hopefully you guys can take the next big step. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Public speakers. Yes. We also have Lisa Sandoval and Tony Tapiz. Good evening, President Dodge, uh, Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, and all the community members that are here. I just want to thank you for your consideration of extending the MOU for EA Hall Fields. I have been involved with Parho Valley Little League now for, I'm trying not to get emotional because my children were highly involved with Little League, um, for about 15 years. And um, like Shane mentioned, we started a, uh, started a team. I made him come out and help us. His son was actually born while he was coaching our teams. Um, not literally on the field, but and we brought in his special needs nephew. And just it was amazing to watch these kids develop from did not matter what their abilities were when they came out. And to watch them be excited about hitting the ball and running to being able to catch a ball. My husband and I have coached for multiple years. We met playing base or coaching Little League and so I just really appreciate you guys taking the opportunity to approve this. We have lost multiple fields over the last five or six years to soccer which I my kids played soccer as well so I appreciate that but um, Little League has taken a huge hit with it and um, we have not been able to have proper practice fields and so it's really important that we don't lose the A Hall as well so thank you.
Good evening, uh, trustees. Um, uh, I've been involved in Pajaro Valley Little League since last Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, you know, uh, in meeting the families, you know, I realize how important it is for us to have access to playing fields. And, um, you know, I've, I've devoted a lot of my spare time to access to the, the children of the Pajaro Valley, whether it was with Taekwondo or um, on the uh, Special Ed Advisory Committee for the district, um, the Policy Council for Head Start. That's been what my wife and I have devoted ourselves to. And I just want to say that I think it's very important that we don't take away any access um, and uh, uh, especially uh, uh, with respect to EA Hall. Um, that is exactly where my son will practice and play uh, over the, the season. So I just want to uh, voice my support for this MOU and hope that you will approve it to uh, maintain that access that families really do depend on here in Watsonville. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any discussion from the board? Trustee De Serpa. Um, I too was involved with Little League, although I was up in Aptos for about eight years. I managed every team my son was on. And I remember very vividly the morning I would wake up and realize I was the snack mother <laughs> and have forgotten that duty and had to run out real quick and get snacks. But anyway, I just want to say I am in full support and we're very happy to partner with you. Thank you. Thanks for all your volunteers and all the work that you've done over the years. Karen, did you want to say something? Super glad you're going to do it, and we're happy. I'm sure our board's going to vote for it, of course. Um, <laughs> and um, great Aurelio seeing you work on this, too. <laughs> all these people I know. Um, yeah, I think it's wonderful. So I'm going to make a motion. Oh, that we approve the MOU. Do, do we have any other comment? Well, we can comment after that okay. too. Okay. Well, we can comment like after that. I would second that motion, and I'm in full support of approving this tonight. Okay. Okay. So we'll take a vote. All in favor of this MOU? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. So while everybody's taking pictures, next up we're going to have visitor agenda items, and that's going to be 6.1. No, no, no. Come on, you asked me about my friends here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Item 6.1, visitor non-agenda items, public comment. So here we go. If I can, I, I have a few of you, so if I can have you in groups of three line up at the podium. The first three are Karen Aus, Dr. Uh, Gina Deshira, and Evelyn Polito. I am here to comment on item number 6.1. This is for our teachers. Uh, my name is Karen Aus. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm a parent of a student at Valencia Elementary School. I was a student at Mar Vista from kindergarten through third grade, a student at Valencia Elementary from fourth through sixth grade, 
and a student at Aptos Junior High, seventh and eighth grade. I returned to Valencia Elementary 2003 to 2005, where I worked as the Kids' Corner Counselor, servicing the students of the elementary school, working through all sorts of issues that teachers couldn't attend to in the classrooms. Um, I've also volunteered in my daughter's kindergarten class, first grade class, and have attended a few field trips, second, third, and now uh, the upcoming Sacramento field trip for the fourth grade. I am here to express my huge dismay that <laughs> teachers are not getting a contract to pay them appropriately. Our teachers are fabulous, they're overworked, they're underpaid, and they're outstanding. <laughs> um, I want to say that I was pretty disgusted by the um, push to have students improve their attendance, and that without a particular at number of attendants, teachers couldn't get their, their pay. And what upsets me about that is the huge oversight to the amount of trauma that many of our students experience on a daily basis or on a monthly basis without throughout the year. The first year that my daughter attended Valencia Elementary School, at my time? That was the time. Great, thanks. Uh, I'm here, uh, my name is Gina Deshera, Dr. Gina Deshera, um, and I'm a veteran teacher. I've been teaching at Lakeview Middle School since it was opened, and in spite of the poor, poor pay in the Pajaro Valley Unified District, and as I see it, no hope for better pay, because every year it's the same struggle for, a, for 1%, that's, it's just, that's just a slap in the face. But I'm here to talk about the Willie Brown Act. You as a governing board are allowed to establish the regulations for Ed Code 44922. And this is uh, a reduced workload uh, that teachers, uh, when they're 55 and have 10 years uh, in the district, can opt for a reduced workload. The district in the past has allowed us to share contracts and be creative about the many ways of doing this. So for example, at my school, there was an art, two art teachers who shared a contract in their last years. Now I'm being told that the only way to reduce a contract in pre-retirement is by accepting a part-time position that is already available through the district. In other words, I would have to look at the part-time positions and accept some random part-time position at another school. I'm asking the school board to uh, regulate this and please encourage the school district to follow the precedent of allowing teachers to be creative, to share contracts in their pre-retirement in our last years. Teaching is very stressful and if you expect us to stay a lifetime, we need these valves, valves for releasing stress. And many of us um, would like to stay teaching. You have a teacher shortage. You need us to stay in the classroom. If you want us to stay there, please allow us creativity in the Willie Brown Act. Thank you. There's an insurmountable of weight that rests on the shoulders of PV teachers. The stress of creating an engaging classroom, the scraps of resources that the district gives them. The stress of making ends meet because their pay is not adequate to the expense of living in this area. The guilt that comes along when teachers leave their students from PV to another school that will pay them more. Are their students here worth it? Or is their financial stability worth more? Do they want to stick next to the students that are always forgotten and ignored? Or do they want to afford a house of their own? Students are the, teachers are the soul, and the youth is the heart of this community. And we rejoice in the presence, the presence of adults that actually care. The district believes that test scores and attendance is all that matters. And if scores are low, teachers must be doing something wrong. That's the logic, right? Step foot in a PV classroom, 
and you will see how smart we are. And while you're there, take note of the student to teacher ratio. Take note of the absent cross guard and the traffic. Take note of the students walking from PV to Rolling Hills for practice. Take note of the trash that parades our campus. Take note of the way students talk about the school district. Take note of the way teachers will disregard your presence. Take notes on our resilience. Take notes on our hard work. Take notes of all the good things of PV or just simply notice something. I can use the most powerful adjectives, the most depressing student anecdotes, the most moving statistics and yet nothing works. And we are still here and they're still fighting. And I have witnessed teachers protest for fair pay in elementary school. And now I'm reaching the end of my senior year and teachers are still desperately asking. And you stand before me and there's a, ball of there's a ball of disgust in the pit of my stomach that has been accumulating, getting bigger and bigger. The more I realize that you don't care about PV students and you care even less about our teachers. I am the product of their hard work, of their dedication. And the outrage I feel towards you is a repercussion of your inaction. If I can have the next three people line up, Chris Webb, Sarah Leonard, and David Perez. So I'm back, I was here two weeks ago, and um, I would love for all the teachers and parents from Paro to stand up. Thank you for being here. We have all paused our incredibly layered, dense, busy lives when we wanna be at home. My son is at home by himself right now, and we are here. We are here because we need you to listen. The latest effort is to make the 1% meager salary increase contingent upon 97% ADA for the first year and worse with an expectation needing to be met with an increase of 4.5% more kiddos for the district average the second year in order for teachers to receive their 1% pay raise. I have sent home three flyers to my 31 students and their families so far in the three weeks that this campaign has run so far. Expensively produced posters decorate our school, inspiring increased attendance. The line is crossed when it becomes my job as an educator to nourish this 97% goal, and then in fact only get my 1% salary increase if this goal is attained. I actually was a homeschooling coordinator for a year and made home visits to my students. Being a classroom teacher has been challenging and wonderful, and as my 22 years can attest, Two, grit and zest are central to my stamina and devotion in this missionary-spirited profession. It is deplorable and wrong that teacher salary be contingent upon a 97% ADA average for the district. Those stats are not made transparent to us, which means we literally are being held to a standard that is unclear and therefore unattainable. I would never teach like this to my students. I would never not provide expectations that are clear. I would never not show them a rubric. Without transparency, how can we know week to week whether teachers have met this goal? Our principal has asked us to share this in an email, so she shares week to week because I asked her. But we still don't have any idea what all the schools are attaining week to week. How the hell are we supposed to meet this goal? And is it even in our sphere of influence? Please consider what we are doing tonight. Please consider what you are doing. Please rethink what you are thinking right now because it is wrong. Good evening, I'm Chris Webb from uh, Renaissance High School. Uh, first, I, I look forward to hoping that the board will support a forthcoming resolution to enact a health protective maximum contaminant level for chromium-6 that we'll then submit to the state government. Um, regarding this offer, the 1%, um, 
I would ask the district to, or the board to consider what does this really say about your values or what you don't value um, between the offer, which considering what little control we have over attendance, it's uh, rather insulting. And I think of the overemphasis on P PBIS combined with it, and I increasingly get the sense that not only are teachers not valued, but education generally isn't, and we're sliding towards uh, babysitting or just, just marking kids present, uh, no matter what pandemics may come or anything like that. Um, what's particularly insulting is that I've been in the district long enough to know that here we are coming up on quarter four, and I know that in quarter four, the, the SARB system goes from uh, just poor to like completely broken. And it gets to the point where eventually when I flag students for attendance, there's absolutely nothing that gets done and I'm told to basically wait till next year. Um, furthermore, I think that, uh, I, I remember when Dr. Rodriguez came to our site and spoke of electives helping to uh, bring kids to school and I think that she's right on that. But the problem is I noticed that we have five vacancies at my site and I can't help but think that possibly the comparatively low salaries may be a reason for these electives being persistently at, there. When, when I bring up this offer to teachers outside of the district, the, it, it's laughable. I get reactions of shock. I get, um, that's not something you can control. I get, that doesn't even cover inflation. So if we're not even gonna, if you're gonna offer 1%, that should be non-contingent. Anything below inflation should just be non-contingent. If you want to offer something with a contingency, it should be more minutes. respectable, like 5 to 10%, I'd say. Thank you. Hello, good evening. My name is David Perez, and um, I'm a teacher at Pajaro Valley High School. I think this is my 24th year in the district, and uh, I have three things I just want to say. The first one, because I'm looking at your faces, is a thank you. Oh, we're getting a field. So it's been a long time coming, and we're watching it little by little just turn into something that we know is going to be spectacular. So thank you for that. The second thing I want to bring up is the CTE teachers. Uh, we're getting some mixed uh, news on what we're keeping or not keeping. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how important you think it is, but it is super important to our students. It's something that that's going to follow them forever, uh, from nursing and health, uh, uh, the bike tech program, uh, the athletic, medical. It, it's it's all great. Whatever you can do to try to hang on to that is for the kids. They they would miss it immensely. And the last thing is, um, 1% is a really tough thing. It's, it's amazing how much and how many teachers were here to try to get 1%. It's, it's really sad that we're groveling here for 1%. <laughs> uh, but grovel we shall. So please, do your best to help us and get us at least that little morsel. All right, thank you very much. I can have the next three line up, uh, Gary Martindale, Jim Lucas, and Elizabeth Thorne. Hello, board members and Dr. Gonzalez. Um, I'm Gary Martindale. I've taught at Watsonville High for, uh, I think, 11 years. I changed over to PV High. I'm one of the founders of PV High. I worked and volunteered a lot of my hours working with members in the district office to help found PV High. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about something I see as a very big concern. I looked at a Learning Policy Institute study on teacher shortages in California and uh, what the status of that is, the sources and potential solutions. This was published in October of 2018 and the findings were that there's a decline in new teachers being produced in the state of California with an increase in demand. Okay, well how do you meet that increase in demand? Later on in the study, it cited that what supports retention? If you can't get new teachers to come in to replace the attrition, what supports retention? And they found out that 
there's three things that teachers cited as what's needed for support. One is the status and respect for the teaching profession. And the, another one is compensation, which includes fair salaries and the housing costs of the community. Another one is having a supportive administration. Well, when you look at the contract offer we've been offered, every person I have spoken to agrees with me that the offer that has been put on the table before us doesn't meet the standard of any one of these things that teachers need to want to continue to teach. That offer is a slap in the face. It's an insult, especially the fact that it's attached to us being responsible for getting kids to school. Who thought that up? <laughs> Who is actually doing that in the state of California? So I just wanted to uh, point that out, and I hope that you guys can offer us a fair contract, because this isn't fair. My name's Jim Lucas. I'm an English teacher at Pajaro Valley High School. I have been there for 13 years, all 13 years of my teaching. I was in the corporate arena for over three decades. And I'm saying that, you know, I work for some of the largest corporations in Silicon Valley, rose to the level of senior vice president. And I gave that up to be a teacher. <laughs> Starting salary for new teachers, just under $47,000. That's about 39, less than 3,900 a month. After deductions, taxes, et cetera, that's less than 2,500 a month. The average rent in Watsonville is over 2,600 a month. Something's wrong here, folks. So last year we had a survey that was given results in a safe school environment and better student achievement. Our teachers are the foundation for student success. Reward them by investing. This is an investment, folks. Investing in their long-term employment in this district. Otherwise, we're going to be what we are right now, a combat zone. Where we're going to lose good teachers. Thank you. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Thorne. I am a school nurse in this district. I have a ridiculous caseload, but we're not here to talk about my caseload. We're here to talk about that because I'm a nurse, one of the things I can do is help with this attendance. That makes sense for the nurses to help. Does it make sense for the teachers? Not so much. Somebody mentioned that we have a supposed pandemic coming our way. There's nothing the teachers can do about that. There's actually not that much I can do about it either. But to have your pay be predicated on something like that, where we don't have a whole lot of control, including the kids who go to Mexico, like, uh, you know, I guess the teachers are supposed to fly down there and bring them back. I don't know. I don't really see how that is something they can do. Anyway, I uh, brought a friend with me. Her name is Tace. She's a math teacher at Watsonville High School. And she wanted to also say a couple words, too. So my name is Tacey Gucci. Um, I am, teach math at Watsonville High School. This is my second year there. I am fully credentialed. I have a Master's of the Arts in Education. I have received nothing but stellar reviews the entire time I was there. And I am a non-reelect. And I just want to know why. Thank you.
I can have the next three line up. Um, Melinda Luna, Aaron, is it Levi, Levi or Levi? And uh, Sherry Osterland. All right, can we have our kids come up with us instead of, they have a separate card, but it'd be really great if they could follow us. I have my card, her card, and Miles. their card. It'd be great if you could, Miles and so Oscar. that we can support them while they're up here too. Thank you, I appreciate that flexibility so much. Um, hi, my name is Melinda Luna, and thank you very much for hearing us through tonight. Um, there are a lot of people who are going to, um, I teach kindergarten bilingual at Starlight Elementary. Um, there are a lot of people who are gonna be talking about the 97% and how hard it is and how it's not on teachers or shouldn't be on teachers to achieve in order to get a raise. So what I wanna talk about is what I already do and how I support my students and I wanna put it back on you, what are you doing? And how are you supporting my students, okay? In the first month of school, I identified at least four students who had major attendance issues. I had two of them who had already missed a quarter of school, and I had the other two who were late every single day by at least 15 minutes. Nothing happened. I let my attendance secretary know, she called home. I let my principal know, I don't know if she did anything or not. I never got a report back. Conferences, I meet, oh, wait, before conferences, I text families, I set up extra meetings on my prep time to talk with them about how I can help them get their kids here every day and on time. I have meetings, I set meetings with families at conferences. We discuss attendance again. By now, my, I'm sorry, I had five. My three that were coming late are coming on time. My two that were absent, we're maybe missing you know, one day every other week instead of one day a week, okay? Without the support of administration, I have very little power. As soon as I had my administrator, I told her she had to come to an IEP that a student was going to because that IEP could not go through because her attendance was so poor that our psychologist will not look at the student's progress because there's not good enough attendance to show that it's not about attendance. And yet, was there a SARB? Were there home visits? Was anyone doing anything except me to worry about that child's attendance? I'm Oscar, I go to Alianza School, third grade. I'm Miles, I uh, go to Starlight Elementary, fourth grade. I don't think it's fair that teachers' payment rely on the kids because you can't control if the kids come to school. And it depends on the kids. I don't think it's fair for my mom to not get paid enough if just because her kids aren't coming. I feel that you should have one payment and one steady payment and only lower if they're absent like 10 days. Like Oscar said, um, I don't think it's fair that the teachers should rely on their students' attendance just to get a raise because the kids are going through their own stories at home and they could be like sick and that makes their attendance low and then the teachers don't get paid. So that's why I don't think it's fair. That's right. And um, to piggyback on that, Miles, my son Miles here. Miles is in school every day, unless he has a fever. But I do have kids that are out with fevers just this week. I can't even get 97% attendance since this campaign started because I've had a girl out with a broken arm. I've had students out with fever. I've had students out with viruses. And every single student that's been out of my class has been sick. I can't help that. Our community is living in different environments. Not everybody has central heating. Not everybody has three blankets on their bed. Not everybody has the same accommodations that we all have. And I just want us to take that into consideration as well. And 97% um, attendance is very inaccessible 
and a 1% raise does not compensate all the inflation that is going on in our community. We all know that most of us teachers don't own homes. Most of our teachers here have been, I've been here 17 years as a bilingual teacher at Starlight Elementary, same classroom, and I have to come here every year. You see my kids here since they've been little. Every board meeting, every time, we have to come here and beg you for a raise because that's the way we roll in PVUSD, and it's embarrassing, and it's, you know, we're humble and we're up here. Um, I'm very active in our school district, and I help out with family literacy, nutrition, Zumba, the Moss Migrant Science Program, after school, Saturday school. I can't control broken arms and drippy noses and kids who have blisters on their heels and why they didn't come to school because they had that blister on their heel. It's not under my control. So I just want you to take that into consideration. Watsonville um, Little League is up to $170 for the season. Prices are going up across the board. Food, expenses, all of the um, fun things for our kids in our community. Thank you for considering our 1% raise or better. Thank you. Is uh, Sherry Osterland still here? Good evening, board. You might know I'm not Sherry Osterland, but I'm going to read something for her that she sent to me because she had to leave to go attend a conference for her students. So this is from Sherry Osterland. She's a teacher at Pajaro Middle School. She says, this is my 27th year of full-time teaching, but I started at PVUSD the same year as Dr. Rodriguez. I came from Ohio, was hired over the phone, not knowing anyone in California except my mom, my brother, and his family. I went to the welcome back breakfast, got lost on the way, sat in the audience by myself, quite nervous and not knowing a soul. As I listened to the new superintendent's vision, I was filled with optimism and hope. I don't feel that way anymore. My initial reason for moving here is gone. My mom passed last April. But I have come to love this district. I love my coworkers, I love my students, and I truly love the work I do. It's really hard, but I enjoy the challenges that it presents. I had never taught students classified as ELD. My first year, I was one of nine new teachers. My second year, there were eight new teachers. I have witnessed good teachers leave because they can't afford their basic needs. I have coworkers who live in two bedroom apartments with three other people. This is embarrassing to our profession. This should embarrass you. I am one of many who currently work a part-time job to keep from having roommates. I have a master's degree and I am 58 years old. I'd like to recoup over the weekend rather than unload trucks. This board currently employs someone to handle attendance. Perhaps you should get your own administrative house in order rather than dump those responsibilities on the teachers with this asinine offer. I am one of the schools that has great attendance. In fact, I have only one student who is an attendance issue, so I'm not sure if what you're asking me to do is adopt kids from another school or what. I can have the next three line up. Uh, Laura Zucker, Felipe Hernandez, and Sarah Baumgart. Hey, my name is Laura Zucker. I'm a, a speech language pathologist at H.A. Hyde School. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. I was looking at the consent agenda, and I saw that there is a requ um, approval of an architect agreement for PVSD Towers Modernization. And it says, what I found in printing, the, and I don't know much about this, but it seems that it says that the original, there's something like, uh, this is not a complete modernization. It's limited to a project budget of $5.5 million and says for the purpose of this proposal, the design construction budget is set at 70% of this value or about $3.9 million. At any rate, that sounds like an awful lot of money. Um, you know, you may tell me that we're wrong, it's already committed, blah, 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 but I have to tell you this looks bad. This is bad optics. You're telling the community, teachers and families, that there's no money for a decent raise. 
let alone, you might, I think you're also telling, because that's still on the, on the table, that maybe there's not enough money to cap special ed caseloads and class sizes. And yet, we're spending millions of dollars to make the vestibule bigger in the towers? Really, it's supposed to make the entranceway bigger, or maybe a reception hall bigger. Um, this does not look good to our parents. Our parents want the district to be able to attract teachers who are qualified, especially teachers we can't get for easily, like math teachers and special ed teachers and science teachers, and they want to keep these teachers for their children so that there's some continuity and not a revolving door of teachers. Our teachers have made it so clear that the ADA contingency has to be off the table. If you look at the ADAs in other states, I took a brief look, and it looks like South Carolina has an ADA of like 88%. I didn't see any 97%. I didn't look at all the states. But it just seems gruesome to put this on the families, too, as someone said about the trauma. We have parents in transition. We have parents working two and three jobs. It's a little bit ghoulish to act like parents, to act like parents just have to try harder to get their kids to school. Um, and the 1%, it, even without the contingency, as you've seen, is very insulting to teachers. We cannot sell this to our membership. So the other, other bit of bad optics is if it looks like you're stalling. It needs to come off the table. We need a decent, real, serious proposal. It's gonna look worse and worse to the community the longer this goes on with the idea of a very bad 1%. Thank you. Um, I'm Sarah Baumgart. I'm, I work at Watsonville High School, and I just want to uh, speak for five seconds, and then I'm going to give the rest of my time to Pablo Barrick. On Friday, the new science teacher at our school that I've been mentoring for the last two years told me that he is not returning and that he's leaving our district. And I just am so demoralized from that because that is 25, I don't even know how many hours I've invested into his professional development, another new teacher we've lost. Um, I'd request that you pull uh, the cards for uh, Carlos Patino, uh, Annette Beatty, myself, and um, uh, Jorge Manriquez. I'm gonna, they're going to secede their time to me. Uh, Carlos Patino. Annette Beatty, uh, Jorge Manriquez, and then myself, Pablo Barrick. Right here, we're representing um, approximately 70 years of math teaching experience here in this district. If you, if you include Vivian, who's also a colleague of ours, that's another 40 years, so that's 110 years. So we got something to say. Can, one second. Can yeah, we do that? Okay. Or Uh, trustees. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll just take a second. I want to regard these heroes here. You guys are heroes. You're working hard. You deserve better. And, and you got to decide what you're worth. And I appreciate you being here. Um, this is in regards specifically to uh, teacher retention and in uh, particular to Watsonville High. I have two letters here um, that I'd like to pass to each of you board members. And I'd like to empower you guys to realize that you decide the priorities of this district. You have been uh, given the trust of the people of this community to do that. And we believe that you can do that. And you can help guide this district into how to spend the money and how to make things a priority. So these two letters that I have, and I have one for um, superintendent and each one of you, uh, if you'd like to get them, they're anonymous letters from two teachers at our site. I'm not gonna read the letters to you. I'll let you read them on your own. And uh, if we can bring those up to you, that would be great. A couple of meetings ago, it was told to me, I think by one of our members, that a particular community member came here and gave a, a speech on you know, NWEA scores at Watsonville High and grades. And uh, he made the, the connection, the correlation, that um, the NWEA scores were poor at our school, but the grades did not reflect that poor score. And his conclusion was that we have bad math teachers at Watsonville High School. I'm not here to set the record straight, but maybe just to add to that record. One, I teach statistics. And as a statistics teacher, I know that correlation does not mean causation. <laughs> the 
But I'll give you another example of a concern about staffing students or staffing teachers at our school and how it hurts our students. He has an argument. There are bad teachers when there are no teachers. When you have a long-term sub in a classroom, there is not learning going on. There is babysitting going on, and that is a disservice to this community. I have been in this PVUSD district for 50 years. I know I look pretty young, right? <laughs> That's because I started here as a four-year-old in kindergarten. <laughs> Went to Calabasas. I did second grade twice. I liked it so much. <laughs> Went to uh, Rolling Hills and graduated from Watsonville High, my alma mater, where I teach now. Just some quick bullet points about what these teachers are saying here and to let you know why there is going to be such a, a shakeup at our school. We have 13 teachers at our school in the math department. Seven are looking for other options. One can't be there because his grades aren't good enough. He doesn't have a credential, so he's got to go and do that. One's retiring. That happens. That's okay. That's fine. One was not asked back. I don't know why. I'm not going to... I'm not going to speak to that judgment or that wisdom. It's beyond my pay grade. Two are looking at other places. And the things that they say in this letter as you read them are as they do not feel supported by their administration, they do not feel safe, and the pay sucks. Something else for you guys to think about with this whole contingency. You are actually putting all these teachers in a position of defrauding the state of money by telling them you got to make sure the kids are in the classroom. And if we're an ADA, I think that's average daily attendance, right? Mm -hmm. So you're telling them it's up to you to make sure those classes are full, that those rosters are full. And a desperate person will do desperate things. Think of it this way. What if the offer was instead not so abstract as attendance, but hey, you got to get those grades up. What are your kids getting if you want to raise, folks? Defrauding the state is not a good idea, and it's not a good idea to put teachers in that kind of legal position, especially when you got DeVos roaming around trying to devour public schools everywhere. So I empower you guys. Think hard about what we need. So this is our scenario at Watsonville High. We have as many as seven teachers not going to be there this year. I've been there 15 years, and we've lost at least one teacher every single year at that school. So how do you create a continuum of thought and learning and growing for our students so that that great teacher that you saw here get that reward can have those students actually in her class, in her Calculus BC class? We have Math 1, Math 2, Math 3, Statistics, Calculus, Pre-Calculus, Pre-Calc Honors, and these people kick butt. They work really hard. They know how to do the workarounds to get the students where they need to be. They make it a, a, an environment where there is a high expectation. So what say you? How are you going to keep these people here? Thank you. Our next uh, three, if I can have you line up, Edith Ruiz, Kira DeBiasio, Jorge Suarez, Good evening, my name is Edith Ruiz, and I have to be honest, I didn't come prepared because I should I be prepared, right? I'm gonna show up to work tomorrow and I'm only gonna give 1%, said no teacher ever. Stand up, everybody stand up, teacher stand up. Every time I have a meeting, our principal starts, everybody, you know, move, say hi to shakes. There's so many of us from different schools we haven't even said hi to each other, where are you from? Good afternoon, good evening. Um, whenever we're, Someone visits my classroom, which is a kinder bilingual class in Landmark Elementary. My kids say good morning, and they, they get back to work, you know. And so welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm so proud of all the students that are still here, because you have to be at school tomorrow. 
My daughter is one of them is a little sick, so she's not here. The other one's starting for AP classes. So thank you for being here. All the parents that are still here with their kids and the ones that went home, thank you for being here. I just want to say that I felt really insulted when I came in today. Um, they were making sure people sat down uh, in, before they were letting people in. I think that's an insult. Some of us need to stand up for health reasons. Um, and two things I wanted to say. Um, my, I'm a product of Watson High, so thank you to the Wildcats and all the teachers. Um, I want to thank the math department from Watson High because my daughter has taken all of their math classes. They are amazing. And I am sad to hear that they're letting uh, one of their math teachers go because as it is, there's not many teachers that want to teach math. Yep. I have a child in middle school now that lost her um, band teacher because he was done with our district, so he left. My daughter is really sad, and she says, we, now they finally found a great sub, um, and she was already playing an instrument. She can no longer take that instrument home to keep practicing that music. So I think that's really sad. That's super sad. Another thing that I wanted to say is, I teach at Larmark Elementary School, and we have, I'll say it really quickly, we have some K, TKK classes that is not acceptable. The TK students have other needs, the kinder students have other needs. Safety, emotional, that has to change for next year. And I know, I'm gonna just say one thing. I just want you to know that it's an embarrassment to hear a 1% race. I have been sick as a dog and I have still given 100% when I show up every day to work. I have been in the district for 16 years and I love my job and I love my students and I love to connect with them out in the community. So I don't wanna move, but I could, I have that option. I have just not chosen not to. So please take into consideration, we have a lot of brand new teachers that cannot stick around. I have because my kids are here, but I probably won't do it after five years from now. So thank you. Hi, my name is Kira DiBiaso. I'm a fourth grade teacher at Bradley Elementary. And I just, um, I came late to the game uh, to becoming a teacher. I just got my clear credential last year. Uh, when I went through my program, I learned about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It opened my eyes to the real needs of my students. Food, water, and shelter were of the utmost importance if that child was gonna have any chance of ascending the pyramid to feel a sense of accomplishment, to gain respect of her peers, and to fully achieve her potential. After four years of working as a teacher for PVUSD, I'm becoming increasingly aware of the fact that while I feel very committed to the well-being of my students, it seems like the district is disinterested in my getting my basic needs met. I can afford food, clothing, and water, but living in this area is very challenging to afford shelter. Housing is a basic need, and if I can swing the bottom tier here, I'm having a very tough time maintaining my health because our focus on attendance flies in the face of what the rest of the world calls self-care. Rest and recuperation can only come when we feel safe and secure that our well-being is valued by the district. Tying our puny rays to attendance <laughs> regards our health certainly, but also seems an unprofessional approach to honoring a profession in which we constantly have to prove ourselves. Our students are our number one priority, but I ask that you please make the employees yours. Good evening, thank you for letting me talk. Uh, my name is Jorge Suarez and I'm a parent um, uh, for two kids in uh, Mar Vista. And so I have no agenda, I'm just here to speak from my heart and maybe share my views on what I'm seeing here. Um, my, I've been in HR and employment negotiations and all those things throughout my career and I've never seen anything like this. In the private sector, you don't wait a year and a half or two years or a year to just get some sort of 1% raise about something that is quasi unattainable. Um, and I'm just interested to know what kind of system you use uh, to sit and understand um, both sides. You have the same needs that they have, that I have, to have a fair paying job, consistent job, be treated with respect, you have the same fears that they have. You have the same desires that they have. 
and vice versa. And I'm just floored to see that, by the way, thank you all of you for teaching our kids. They are the parents away from home. And I entrust them with their care, kindness, empathy, patience, perseverance. And I just would like to know who had the idea of saying, it's like if, if your bonus is based on 97% district attendance, that you would get a 10% bonus. I don't think that would be fair to you. I just don't think. Something like that. Something unattainable, unrealistic. And I am not going to let my kid go to school if my kid is sick. We are at the, at the borderline of a worldwide epidemic issue with this coronavirus. And I hope that he doesn't get to this area. But if he does, that, if, if you approve that 1% bonus, well, that's going to be gone. People are going to be afraid to send their kids to school. And Karen was talking about, I know we only have three minutes for a year and a half of negotiations, but I, <laughs> I, I just want to say this. My kids are experiencing this trauma that Karen was talking about. My daughter was sick one day and she says, but I have to go to school because I'm going to be pressured by my peers. Because if I don't go, they're going to tell me that I'm a wimp. Just think about that. So please, I, I don't think you're waiting for a year and a half of negotiations on your bonuses either. And I think they don't, they shouldn't wait that long either. Just do something, get on it, and just be, open up. This is, this is ridiculously ridiculous. So thank you. And I don't want to be here The last two I have are Francisco Estrada and Sonia Quintero. Oh. Sonia Quintero. Left. Did Sonia leave? No, she's here. Oh, oh. come on. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Sonia Quintero and I work at Calabasas Elementary School in this district. And um, I've been working here for 20 years as a teacher, six years as a aide, six years as a parent volunteer in this district. Some of my favorite things about this district are that my students and their families and the health benefits we get here. A uh, challenge for me is the PVUSD is working conditions and the salary and cost of living. Many teachers work more than one job to make ends meet. I know that the union is currently working with the district to negotiate things in our contract. And the proposed language of a 1% raise is in contingency on the student's attendance is disrespectful to us as teachers. And all we do, and all we do to help to support our students' learning. This does not make for better working conditions. We should not have to get any raise contingent on daily attendance. We do our job in teaching our students. It should not be our job to ensure their attendance. I want to stay in this district, and I need a commitment from the board and the district that I am valued and a priority. Budgeting for a, per, a proper raise keeps qualified teachers here and directly supports the students I work with. Our working conditions are our students' learning conditions. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> next, we have employee organization. We have 7.1 PVFT. Hi. I really look forward to seeing you guys. Well, if I take my glasses off, I could see you guys. Um, so, thank you for those of you who have stayed this long. <coughs> um, it isn't, I'm going to speak to you guys first. <laughs> it's, this is what, what, thank you for electing me to be your leader. Our membership, you, you, um, So 
So, <clears throat> good evening. Um, here we are, still fighting over something. The, the one word that is the most insulting word on that piece, on the piece of paper that you all have allowed the, the district to deliver to us. And I have actually several pages written. I probably won't even read them all because I'll just speak from the heart more, more than this, what I have outlined. But you have here many people, teachers, our educators that are taking the time, and it's not necessarily that it's, you know, give me a raise. It's how dare you let this happen to our community? You are the gatekeepers for, the, for our community. You're our bridge. You hold the district accountable. You have the power. You've had parents come and speak already. That is more than enough. That energy of the parents can grow. You guys are in an elected position. Your job is to ensure that our students are receiving the rightful education and that they are receiving it from the qualified educators that are out there ready and willing to be here for them, to guide them through their career as a student. So, <clears throat> I'm in always grateful to hear from our members and to hear what they have to say because I've been in this district for 13 years and I can go on and on about my own personal experience but it's every it's our collective experience that really matters. Um, so I, you all be always begin these board meetings with your experiences of what you do during the two weeks that we haven't seen you. Uh, so I just want to share with you a little bit of what I do. Um, and this is actually just from this week, and it's Wednesday. So <laughs> I um, have, we, my colleague, Roddy, I cannot do this alone. I am so grateful that I have a, a colleague who is there to, to, to help as well. Um, Today, I went in and represented, uh, sat and listened uh, with a group of teachers who are being mandated to be, um, to have a, a coach. In our contract, it's something that we can choose to have, but they're being mandated based on test scores. It could be that the entire school site's goal would be to look at a certain subject, true, but to target specific grade levels and base it on their, and mandate them to coaching based on test scores. But that's not happening at any other site. And the only comment that their administrator can give was basically, I get to make decisions. So essentially, deal with it. Um, We've also spoken to several teachers who have been non-reelected, and we're helping them navigate through those um, emotions because especially when they've been told they've been exemplary in all of their observations and suddenly, we're gonna let you go. And how coincidentally that they're in their second year so that if they continue and start the first day next year, they would be tenured. And so these are teachers who have been in our district, this is their second year, who have had their new teacher project, who have been observed by administrators, who have received good evaluations, but they don't want to give them tenure. That's always the fear, and that's always the argument. Oh, but then we have to give them tenure. Um, I've, we've also, a group of our teachers also went to Sacramento yesterday, and we spent a really long time um, advocating for public education funding. So that's something that, that's another thing that we do. <clears throat> that's five minutes. I know that it's time. Um, you've already had one teacher speak to the Willie Brown, the pre-retirement option. We've, that's just one teacher of quite a few that we've been hearing from this, this, this past few week, the past week. 
Um, so this brings me to, um, oh, and, well, this brings me to our state of our negotiations. Um, so we've been asked to take into account this budget crunch. You guys have been asked to take into account this budget crunch. But tonight on your agenda, you get to vote on um, a salary increase for administrators. Yeah, the narrative that's written in the agenda is like, oh, we're saving money. But guess what? We're going to give them an increase. Um, they are going to be working at two sites. But you know what? We have VAPA teachers. We have itinerants who work at more than two sites. Do they get a raise? These um, after-school coordinators will uh, get a raise that, depending on the level, the starting amount that they will be increased to is, well, I'm just going to give you the average, is $28,000. Okay, so then, you know, we're going to hear about the cost of medical going up, but hey, that's okay. It's ongoing for them. They're going to get to see that in their retirement, but we have to somehow control the outside factors that we have no control over to increase to 97% ADA. Um, and then, uh, so again, that's an insult. You look at that and it's like, it just leaves you to wonder, like what, what really is the narrative here? What's the story? We have to save money, but we're gonna, we're gonna give it over to the administrators. So what's the story? Because what I can infer from this is that our teachers and essentially our students, because they're the ones that are left without the teacher that we don't matter, that we have very little, we, we're of very little value. Because again, in that narrative, in your agenda, oh, it's a hard to fill position. But we're gonna let the fully credentialed teacher with a master's degree in math, we're gonna let her go. So, trustees, um, you know, you have the opportunity to set a positive president, precedent in public education and demand, because you have that right, that we are, it's not held, our raise is not held contingent on a 97% ADA. <laughs> Don't be fooled. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that it, or any more? Uh, no. Okay, next up, 7.2 CACA. Um, okay, that was 7.2. Uh, Alger, were, did you want to speak under 7.2? Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Dodge, board members, everybody else here, also including you guys. Um, I just want to go ahead and hopefully make this brief, but I want to get straight to the point. I'll, I'll give a lot of information, so I apologize if I'm speaking a little fast. I just know there's a time limit. Um, so uh, last board meeting, we had a, a person by the name of Bill Beecher. Um, I think this is usually around the time when he speaks. Um, he went ahead and he showed, um, or he expressed his disgust at walking into a classroom and then finding out that there was uh, multiplication charts posted on the wall, posted on um, student desks. And he felt like this was, in his conclusion, this is a clear signal that uh, the math in the district, especially at the elementary level, is so poor that we have to go ahead and have teachers go ahead and post multiplication charts. So therefore, his conclusion was, well, in this case, I suggest go ahead and release all the elementary teachers who are teaching math. Now, um, for those who are Untrained in the field of education, uh, this is actually a very common practice. It's just called scaffolding. Um, just to give you like a clear definition, scaffolding refers to a variety of instructional techniques or strategies being used to support students in order to move them progressively towards independence in a given skill or concept. So basically the idea is you use strategies in order to support children. It's like um, to make it more for the common person, let's say you're trying to teach a child how to ride a bike, you're gonna go ahead and put training wheels on the side. Um, according to Bill Beecher, this is disgusting. Why would you put training wheels on a child? You just let them ride the bike. So I just want to address that point. The second point that he made was um, that part about releasing teachers. So I want to go ahead and just kind of 
hopefully you can follow with me. I'm gonna guide you through a study. Um, this is a very popular theory. It's the theory about the 10,000 hours, which pretty much accumulates to about five years of practice in a field. Um, this one, if anybody's read Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, I think that's where it became a lot more popular in the common conscious. Um, but there was also a study in 2014 by Princeton study. So what they concluded is if they're studying uh, the deliberate practice and its effect on performance, um, this means the following. This is their conclusion. After studying it, deliberate practice in a stable structural field yields high rates of success. So is that two minutes? Would it be okay to finish? It's just, um, I'll try to make it super brief. So in this case, um, the rate of success depends on a stable structured field. So this is important because you, you can't have somebody train for five years and put it in 10,000 hours if the field is not consistent. So in this case, um, take like something like tennis, uh, chess, uh, classical music, it never changes so someone can actually study it up to improve. So now going into the educational field, there's a lot of fluctuation and now this is where it kind of comes into effect. So Bill Beecher was talking about releasing teachers. Um, there was a study that was conducted in 2007 and the study concluded that the single most critical factor in whether students succeed is the improvement of teacher quality. Now in order to do that, um, however, the efforts to improve teacher quality are often dwarfed by the high rates of turnover. So it was actually addressing the turnover rate. It turns out that 40 to 50% of public school teachers leave their local districts within the first five years. Rates are higher in schools serving less advantaged students. This study was conducted in our backyard. This was by the University of California, Santa Cruz. So when they're talking about their study, they're talking about us. And if Bill Beecher is recommending that his solution to poor math teachers is to go ahead and release them, he, it's actually already in effect because we're already losing teachers who are less than five years in tenure at their jobs. So thank you so much. Just something to consider. Thank you very much. Next up, item 7.3, Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. 7.4, Communication Workers of America. Anybody? Okay. Next up, 8.2, Final Watsonville Safe Routes Plan. A little bit of deja vu. <laughs> Good evening, trustees, superintendent, and members of the public. My name is Amelia Conlin. I'm a planner with Ecology Action, here to present to you tonight on the final Complete Streets to Schools plan for the city of Watsonville. So this project is a partnership between the city of Watsonville, the Santa Cruz County Health Department, Pajaro Valley Unified School District, and Ecology Action, and it was funded through a Caltrans Sustainable Communities Planning Grant. Um, this project includes 15 schools within the city of Watsonville, and the overall goal of the project was to establish a list of the barriers to getting to school safely for each of those 15 schools, and to develop a list of recommendations to improve access to each of those schools. And I do want to clarify that we've been working on two projects simultaneously. So both the 15 schools served under the city of Watsonville plan, and six schools in the unincorporated Santa Cruz County um, that are served under a different planning process. So I am hoping to come back before you tonight to discuss the remaining six schools in the unincorporated county. But here tonight, we're focusing on 15 schools within the city of Watsonville. We started off this project back in fall of 2018 with two public meetings in the city of Watsonville where we asked parents and students about their challenges with getting to school and then followed that up with walking audits at each of the 15 schools where we met during the school drop-off um, to observe traffic conditions around each school. Once we had a list of draft recommendations, we presented those back to each school at a parent meeting with the goal of getting input from parents and school staff and making sure that each list of recommendations was the right fit for that school site. We were here before you in November to present the draft list of recommendations and we're here before you tonight to present the final plan. So I wanted to provide a high level overview of the various components of the Complete Streets to Schools plan. And the core of this plan are citywide infrastructure recommendations and infrastructure recommendations for the 15 school sites. The citywide recommendations are those that impact multiple school sites or that cover major corridors within the city of Watsonville. And the school level recommendations are 
serve the area immediately around each school. Again, these recommendations were developed based on input from parents at the parent meetings, um, based on our observations and the engineering expertise of Alta Planning and Design, who served as a consultant on this project, um, and the input that we received during the walking audits. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned before, we did present each list of recommendations back at a parent meeting at each school site um, with the goal of getting that final set of input. This plan is meant as a high-level, long-term planning document and really as a resource for the district so that as you implement projects in the future, you can um, have a resource and some uh, suggestions on possible improvements to improve safety around each school sites. So in addition to infrastructure recommendations, the plan includes program recommendations, and those include recommendations for education programs to educate both students and adults on how to walk, bike, and drive safely. That includes recommendations for encouragement programs to help overcome some of the barriers and allow parents to feel safe sending their <coughs> student to school on foot or by bike. It includes recommendations for enforcement policies, including the school crossing guard program, ensuring that there is a crossing guard available at each school, and looking at opportunities for a countywide crossing guard training program so that all crossing guards are receiving the same information. And then finally, there are recommendations for equity policies uh, with the goal of ensuring that every student in the district has access to Safe Routes to Schools education and encouragement programs. Finally, the plan includes sections on implementation and maintenance, so how the plan will be implemented and how projects will be maintained once they've been constructed. It includes a list of possible funding sources um, that can fund the project uh, list included in this plan. Um, grant funding will be very important to help construct many of these projects um, and leveraging local dollars with grant funding um, is, is a good path towards getting these projects built. And with that, I will turn it over to Murray Fonts, Principal Engineer with the City of Watsonville to talk about some of the projects that are in progress now. Thank you, Amelia. Good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to present this evening. I'm especially appreciative of the collaborative effort that's been put forth over these last two years between the district, the residents of the city of Watsonville to identify ways that we can help our community to live healthier and happier lifestyles. Some of the recommendations that have come out of this report indicate that our efforts are in line with the recommendations. For example, the city has collaborated with Watsonville High School to put together a project to improve Lincoln Street between Beach and Riverside to make it more pedestrian friendly. We secured funding for that project and we anticipate going to, to construction later this year. With existing funding, we have painted green bike lanes within the city of Watsonville for the first time. Several of these are adjacent to or provide access to schools. They include Bridge Street, Green Valley Road, Harkinslew Road, and Walker Street, as well as Rodriguez Street. With the assistance of Caltrans, a flashing beacon will be installed on Beach Street near Marchant to aid crossing at that location. Also, the city has been working with state legislators and other agencies to change the speeding laws so that local agencies can change them to reduce them. The city is in the process of securing funding to construct a pedestrian bicycle bridge across the Highway 1 at Harkinsu Road and to provide other pedestrian and bicycle improvements to allow Pajaro Valley High School students and parents better access. The project is in design. Caltrans is a partner, as is Santa Cruz County. We're hoping that with this funding, we'll be able to go to construction in 2022. Once approved, the plan the city would take the projects identified in the plan and look for opportunities to develop what we call the low-hanging fruit. 
those things that could be incorporated into maintenance projects that go on on a regular basis, repairing sidewalk, replacing curb ramps, and doing minor striping and signage. We also look forward to incorporating these recommendations into current projects where the two agree with each other and support one another. And we would look to identify how these projects might be funded in future funding opportunities. There are examples of where we partnered with Caltrans, such as the Flashing Beacon, and we have partnered with the district on projects in the past and look forward to doing so in the future. The city has contributed funding toward the Bike Smart and Walk Smart safety programs that go on in second and fifth grade classes. We've supported the Earn a Bike program that takes place in middle school classes as well as at Pajaro Valley High School. We're appreciative of the Bike Tech program and its support of this wonderful Earn a Bike program and hope that it can be retained. The city is also designing a trail on Lee Road that would extend from the railroad tracks to Harkinsu Road and to Pajaro Valley High School, which would provide an alternative access for bicycle and pedestrians. Once the plan is prepared, the city anticipates providing copies with the district and looking for opportunities to partner. One item I forgot to mention, on this Lee Road project, we're partnering with the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, and they recently received a letter of support from the district, from Dr. Rodriguez. We appreciate that. That may aid them in getting funding and help us to move along this Lee Road project. So I encourage you to approve it. Watsonville City Council received it and approved it last night so we can move ahead and partner on some of these exciting projects. I would just echo Murray's appreciation of the district for all of the principals who gave us their time to host a walking audit at their school, to host the public meetings, and um, the recommendation before you tonight is to adopt the final Watsonville Complete Streets to Schools plan. Okay. Any public speakers to this item? Uh, Felipe Hernandez, but I don't think he's here anymore. Felipe, are you still here? No. Okay. That's it. Any discussion from the board? Trustee Acosta? Oh, okay. Deserpa? Um, I'm, I'm in full support. I, thank you for all the work that's gone into this for the last two years. I noted just today we think we had a pedestrian um, death associated with a traffic accident. And so, um, as you've, I think you mentioned last time, um, Watsonville, for the size of the community we have, has um, far too many deaths associated with um, vehicular accidents to pedestrians. So anything that we can do to make our community safer, and in particular children, um, I think we all can get behind. So anyway, thank you very much for bringing this forward and for all the hard work that you've put into it. We really appreciate it. Trustee Acosta? Oh. Um, Karen? <laughs> I mean, I know there's, I know you s said something about there's so much more that we f need to probably do, right? Um, and you were, and you're looking for also further grant funding in order to be able to accomplish some of these projects, correct? That's correct. <laughs> mm. Yep. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to ask you, are, what are there things that you would love to have complete that are, that we're not voting on tonight that in moving forward we need to try to see if we can accomplish? What, what are some of those things? If you could explain to me, <laughs> us. As Mr. Serpa indicated, Watsonville is very concerned about the number of collisions that yeah. take place within the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we went after this grant to identify ways that we could make our community safer mm -hmm. for bicyclists and pedestrians in and around the schools. We did a similar grant for the downtown area. We've passed Vision Zero to try and focus on that. So we would like to be partners on identifying ways to do this in the city right-of-way, 
or in the transitions between the city right of way and school district property, or if we can help out on the school district property, we'd want to see that. It isn't limited to just physical improvements. In fact, ironically, the key of it all is up here. We all need to, to take our part. We all need to be part of the role. And we found the greatest success comes through children. You teach the children and they teach their homes. We need to be cautious when we cross the street. We can't assume we'll be safe just because there's a crosswalk. So those are the areas we'd like to partner. Pedestrian education. and bicycle safety projects mm -hmm. and education and programs. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure, I mean, uh, and that's absolutely true. I mean, it's, and it's also, <laughs> you need to sort of educate people that drive cars to, you know, that how to st stop before they turn. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, people, you know, uh, it's definitely our children and it's definitely adults teaching their children, but it's also people driving cars, unfortunately, <laughs> need to learn how to do it better <laughs> sometimes, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't know how we can teach them, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks. Trustee Acosta. Um, yes, I, I'm certainly gonna chime what my colleagues have already said. I mean, we all want to see improvement, and particularly within the city of limits of Watsonville and safe routes for so many of our students that, particularly in this end of the district, walk to and from school on a daily basis. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> just this morning at the end of my street where we live, there was a severe car collision during the morning commute hours. This afternoon, there was a three car pile up just after lunch hour on Main Street. I mean, it, it's just terrific, not to mention the incident that I believe probably was what Trustee DeSerpa was leading to that happened last night That's in the city of Watsonville. I mean, it's just horrific. Um, Um, West, West Fifth, I believe. Walker and Rodriguez, Radcliffe, you know, if we could do something with the lights. Um, I know you guys are looking at Saba because Saba is stuck between West Beach and West Riverside. I know that's a concern. Um, you know, peop I know you were talking about how we need to be more educated on, you know, using the crosswalk, but sometimes we forget that West Beach and West Riverside are highways. And so if we could do a, a little bit more, my daughter's grandfather was hit um, a couple years ago crossing Banker and West Riverside. So if there's a way we can put a crosswalk. Um, but I just wanted to echo all, all the good work that's being done in the community by community citizens. And so we all look forward, you know, whether it's writing a letter or just showing up to meetings. A lot of us here want to help and go the extra mile. So I just want to say thank you. And we have a motion by... Yeah, so I'd like to just um, chime my motion that and honor my colleague that couldn't be here tonight, Trustee Shocker. I'd like to make the motion um, to approve this. I'll second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? No. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Next up, we have agenda item 8.3, approve extended learning coordinator title change and salary schedule placement. Thank you, President Dodge, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, for your consideration. This is a job description for the Extended Learning 
coordinator to replace the after school coordinator position. As noted in the job description summary, the uh, site coordinator is responsible for operational oversight of extended le learning programs, uh, opening the door to oversight of multiple sites for after school, summer school, and intercession. The new position entails additional responsibilities, including oversight of at least two school sites instead of just one. This move will reduce the need of administrative positions as well. While there is a salary adjustment commensurate with the additional responsibilities, even with a salary increase, the change will result in a substantial savings of approximately $300,000 um, as we continue for ways to reduce administrative costs while focusing on our students' educational experiences and program compliance requirements. Here to explain the job responsibilities uh, generally and the salaries is Allison Nisawa, um, Human Resources Director of Certificated Personnel. So yeah, before you, there are three different job descriptions to denote the elementary level, the middle school, and the high school level to be in alignment with the, with the salary schedule. Okay, that's... Okay, so any public speakers to this item? Any discussion from the board? Well, I just... I, I just want to say that, um, you know, I mean, we've heard from some teachers that how could they, how could you dis consider even raising the salary of administrators when, you know, we're not getting salary increments. But I mean, I know, I mean, based on what you said, this is actually eliminating administrative positions and this is actually saving money for our district. 300,000 is not huge, but it's not bad. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not so bad to be able to actually save $300,000. So. I think, you know, hopefully everyone can consider this, even teachers can consider that we're not trying to enhance, I mean, add more administrators, we're actually trying to eliminate some of them and actually save money. So I'm just hoping everyone understands that. Thank you. <laughs> Trustee Ruskell. Yeah, so maybe if you two can expand on that. So can you explain how uh, and what positions, administrative positions, will be eliminated if this was to be voted on tonight? Um, the driving factors between, be, be behind bringing this to the board tonight. Um, so if you can start there, please. The, Great. Yeah. So there are 19, and Carol's behind me, so Carol, if I miss the numbers, there's 19 programs at different sites that require a, an after-school coordinator. So the reduction would be, as Chona was mentioning, um, by reducing administrators, we would have them cover multiple or two sites. Um, I'm hoping I'm answering your question, Maria. Is that what you're asking? No, what administrative positions would be eliminated? So how, how, how many less? Of this? How many less? Are oh, we have? Uh, so 19 divided by two, so ab about nine? Eight, 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 or eight or nine. nine. Mm -hmm. Okay. We currently already have one who's splitting at the high school, so that'll remain, but the, the other ones that are at the middle and elementary schools. Okay. Or you asked a second question. I was. Um, yeah, so, so what's really driving um, staff's decision to bring this forward to the board? Uh, because of the timeline of the March 15th notice that is required per um, ed code. Okay. Any more discussion from the board? I have a motion. I'll make a motion to um, approve I guess you would say eliminating some of the administrative positions um, and adding a new job description for those positions, um, with, which you know increases their responsibility. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Thank Is there you. a second? A second. All right. All in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Next up, we have. Item 9.1, PVOSD, data-driven improvement cycle. Report will be presented by Lisa or Casey. Or, okay, all three. Good 
Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez, Board President Dodge, and Board of Trustees. Uh, this evening, we have the honor of being able to really discuss a few elevation pieces that happened in our instructional cycle this year. Uh, we wanted to actually start with looking at what we all do. So the all-in everyday piece and how does that imply to our departments, our management, our coordinators, how are we of service to students and how are we of ser service to staff. The instructional cycle really is that data-driven cycle, but what we noticed was that we could in indeed do a better job at making sure that we were all accountable as well to making sure we service staff. A few models pieces that we looked at was the ability to be able to plan strategically, do and perform, check more frequently so we could pivot or change the design if we needed to, and then really act on those uh, decisions that we have more frequently. What we did was we started with department scorecards. So department scorecards, this was the first inaugural year that we actually went through with our management teams, started to build the capacity of saying, what is the purpose and the function of that department within our organization? How does that support the instructional programs at our site? And we anchored our work within those departments to looking at what were the strategies that we said we were going to hit. An example would be for middle schools, the alignment of looking at math, literacy, and student connection. Depending on what department you're in, how do you connect the work that you do to those areas? A few highlights up here that we asked management to look at, uh, directors, coordinators, and all managers, was to look at how do you concentrate your efforts around those areas of district-wide goals that we already have to support sites? And then how are we actually track, track, tracking our progress? So as a department, how do we know that our assistance is really being hit and really being receptive? And then those stretch goals pieces of are we using metrics to really inform our practice and changing as we go along if we need to. An example up here is an example of a district scorecard off to the right. You'll see that there's noted metrics within that. And then each department went through to create a goal that really was symbolic of what their purpose and their function in the organization was. We then ran through what we would call a data monitoring protocol. This was by far the, the most challenging part at times because it requires a heavy ability to be able to listen and be reflective of your practice, the work that your departments are doing, and then be able to really re-engage based on what you heard from your feedback of your peers. These are generally designed in presentation mode of saying you have 24 to 30 minutes depending on, on the time allotment that we have. It runs through your presentation, which is uninterrupted, for you to be able to explain what your work is and how you are informing your work. The group then has an opportunity to really ask some probing and some clarifying questions, which led folks down a different path of things that they may or may not have thought of in that work that they crafted. An opportunity for us to be able to talk in what we call warm and cool feedback. So it's what I refer to as talking behind somebody's back, but it's giving them the opportunity to hear you say that in the same room. So it gives you the opportunity to say, oh, that's what people are thinking of the work, or that's what they're wondering. So we had some follow-up pieces as a result of that. Piece that uh, many folks struggle with, including, including myself at times, is that ability to be able to actually reflect on what you heard. Did you hear the feedback that people were giving you based on the work that we're doing? And are you able to actually transition that and have impact with your next steps? And that was a, a, the piece that we started with our departments to help support the next piece, which really was looking at our instructional program as well. So in line with that all in every day, what are we doing to make sure that we're providing metrics within those departments too and holding ourselves to a data-driven accountability cycle as well? Good evening. So the PVUSD data-driven instructional cycle is the plan, do, check, act that we use when we're looking at the school sites. It is also a major part of the principal evaluation. Going through, it's our cycle that we start in August. We almost finish it in June, and it sets the tone for the next, the following school year. I'm going to go through and highlight a few points that are in our, um, the instructional cycle that we look at for our school sites. The process. In the fall, all students take the nationally normed and adaptive map assessment, and based on, in math and English language arts, um, as a baseline to see where students are and how they did um, from their previous years. Based on the scores, uh, principals and looking at how the schools did overall, principals will develop school plans and looking at in terms of areas for instructional growth, areas in instruction where they're doing well, and they'll create plans for the year in terms of how they're going to address the gaps, the areas of a growth, and, um, and then they 
set it out and they do it in front of peers as well as directors, coordinators, and assistant superintendents and a, a superintendent. And so they present their growth, their areas um, for their growth. And um, then we go up to the collaborative visits where a team goes out to school sites and based on school set goals, either from the summits or things that they're working on. This year we're doing a lot of core action work with our new, newly implemented adoptive benchmark in our elementary school sites. We look through and what we do is we really look at the positive things that are happening on the school sites and we set the data so that all staff can see and they're left with a graph so where all staff can see where they are in terms of instructional growth. Um, December, January students take a second test, the MAP assessment. And based on how students do, um, is that some principals will be asked to come back for a second summit. And then we're gonna re then what happens is that their plan that they set out in the beginning at the first summit would be reviewed to see what is going well and what is not going well. Because sometimes adjustments need to be made mid-course. Um, we can't always be the visionaries that we'd like from the very beginning and sometimes things happen, so we might have to reset the course. And then in the summit number two, the, then um, the principals present the area of growth that happened, which uh, based on map number, the second map score, and then they um, have a plan to address the area of growth and how it will be measured. And then at the end of the school year, we look to see whether that worked or whether it did not work. And then that allows the principal to be reflective over the school year to say, in the fall, this is what I set out to do. Yes, it worked or it did not work based on my uh, winter scores. And then in the spring, how did it turn out? So it's a way of principals and administrations to be reflective within their practice and help the, um, the teachers on the school site. So there are several ways to actually read the, the growth measure map. So this first slide that, I'm, uh, that I will be showing you is showing elementary fall to winter growth using RIT, which is the growth and points, the measurement um, tool that MAP uses to actually measure growth. And as you're looking at the bottom of um, th where the key is, where the color coding key is, we notice that we definitely wanna see green and blue because when we're looking at that blue piece, it means we're having double digit growth in their RIT. So we're, or, or not double, double digits in the points that they're, that they're growing in. So if you're looking your attention to second grade, which is at the top, so it starts with second, goes down third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and it goes across to the different um, elementary schools, you will see that a majority of second grade is actually which colors? Ooh. Blue, right? We see a majority of blue and green. So we're experiencing that double digit growth with the RIT. So that's what we want to see because as we're going up the grade levels, more and more we want to get our students to the expectation of grade level, right? And so you will see that there's less and less orange and yellow. So I'm going to um, highlight, let's see, one of our, our um, schools right there. You can see Freedom Elementary right dab in the center. They've experienced 10.2 um, increase with their RIT. So that's what we want to see, and, and it will get them clo uh, um, closer to grade level. So as we're moving on, here is now you'll see the um, elementary in reading. And the same as we're looking at the key at the bottom, Again, we're seeing more and more what colors at the top? Blues and greens, right? And the greens are actually increasing throughout as we're going up the grade levels. And yes, we do still have, continue to have areas of growth. And that is part of coming up with those action plans and helping our, our teachers and principals look at that data so we can continue um, growing. Right. I'm gonna hand it off to Chris. In moving over to our middle schools, you'll see essentially the same function that Casey was discussing in terms of the RIT scores. Uh, a few highlight pieces to take a look at. You do not see blue and green up there yet. Uh, we are moving in the right direction in a few areas. A couple of highlights to look at in terms of the differences in the RIT scores itself. Uh, a couple of pieces looking back from the 18-19 school year. 
in looking at similar co cohort data of, I'll take EA Hull, for instance, our seventh grade what had a difference of the writ of their norm score of 17.9. That cohort this year moving into that eighth grade year is at a writ score away from norm of 10.7. So you're starting to see some growth and starting to see some gaps, um, but we are still not where we need to be. A few pieces that we've looked at in terms of targeting this and some areas of weakness that we're looking at specifically is the seventh grade. Um, what can we do to assist? I will tell you that even in middle school, it is one of the harder grades. Uh, our sixth graders are coming in, they're not quite sure of themselves, and then our eighth graders have kind of got down the routines and the, p the pieces that they need to have. Um, so seventh grade isn't abnormal to struggle, but we also know that the vertical alignment that we've had with elementary is increasing, the pieces that we're using around PLCs and really bringing teachers to the table and the curriculum pieces to the table to do the planning and look at what the assessment pieces are, um, are also benefiting and helping us. In addition, uh, you do see a green up here, so I want to highlight that at EA Hall. Um, we have a, a 5.9, so made kind of just over that band of uh, moving towards that expectation and moving forward. A few pieces in looking at last year's data, too, in regards to kind of where we are at and what the conditional growth is, and Casey's going to go through that um, in regards to kind of breaking down what that looks like. I'm eager to get to those pieces as well in terms of looking at what that growth was previously, and then where some of those chunks are moving forward in, in the work that we've had. So, I, like I said before, there's several different ways to actually look at the growth and measurement of MAP. And so this next, before we go into the next sli data slides, um, we will be looking at the conditional growth percentile. And this is actually used to measure our students or their classrooms um, against their typical peers like um, across the nation and the norm data there. So if a, if a school came in and they were, um, they're being compared to schools that came in and scored at the same level as they did. And now we're looking at how much they grew compared to similar schools. So as you're looking up here at, again, we have the color coding um, for us. We of course wanna see that, that green and blue and in the past, we've really looked at if we have the CGP over 60, uh, 51%, that's great. That was, that, that's great. We want to actually see them at that norm. But we know now that that increases if our students can actually um, get to that 61 um, conditional growth percentile. That's where they have more success. Um, and we can get them to be college and career ready on that track. So as we're looking at this slide, um, you are gonna notice again, the elementary schools, we're looking at math, and um, we have the RIT score for each school, and then we go to their percentile rank compared to other schools across the nation that's taking those norms that are taking the map, but then the color coding is what we're looking at. That's what we really wanna look at and see how our students are comparing and growing compared to similar schools right and so we're looking again we're noticing that our students are growing more and more historically we have had a lot more of that red so we are reducing that red where our students need to be to be growing even more and you're noticing that um, on the screen i'm going to use freedom again as an example up there they're growing at the 91, the 91st percentile compared to schools that came in scoring at the same place that they did, right? Um, so they may have the, you know, the national percentile at 33, but they're growing compared to like schools at the 91st percentile. So we want to continue that. So again, those blues and greens are that positive growth, and we're definitely reducing those reds and orange, right? And again, here you see it, um, our efforts speak for themselves um, with all of our work with SIPs. This, this next slide is our reading slide, and it's showing again at that second grade level, right, where we're getting our students growing at their foundational skills. They're able to show their growth on the map measure also, which will, as, it, as the students grow and continue to grow up the grade levels, it will definitely be we will definitely be seeing that growth helping out middle school. 
few highlight pieces for mathematics and secondary as well as the reading slides that we come up with. Uh, you are seeing the orange still up there. I, I'll, I'll preface that by saying we actually had a lot more red up there last year, so not quite there yet, moving in the right direction in terms of us getting some lift. Um, but big highlight pieces would be that we have significant increases in blues and greens hitting the board. So uh, last year we had three of those cohort groups. If you look at about 17 up there total, we had three last year that had actually risen to, like Casey said, that like school performance piece and where we were ranking in percentile. Uh, we had three uh, between, blue, between blue and green. Uh, and this year you've seen that double to six. So again, uh, promising movement and as that bubble continues to, to reach middle school as well and the vertical articulation continues, the work that we're doing around PLCs and collaborative walks um, will also continue. Uh, I'm gonna ask the board for a two minute extension if that is possible. Sounds good, Casey. And so, like Lisa said before, we also um, require a second summit for some of our schools just to give that differentiated assistance where we actually have them come in and meet with us and go through a similar protocol so we can come up with an action plan and address various needs. So these schools are um, before you have been chosen for different reasons because the map is all about growth. So we're looking at how can we, if we have some pockets of grade levels that might not be growing or a subject area that's consistently, we're looking at patterns of maybe across years where they need um, support, that's where we bring them in and have another, um, a second summit. And so, of course, we also want to coach and support um, from the district office. We want to be able to support our sites. So as we're looking at, we have um, a list on elementary and secondary of, of supports that we offer. So one of our main initiatives this year is that focus on the core actions, um, the collaborative walkthroughs that we actually go and work with our principals in um, in next steps and identifying what we need our students to be doing um, with our Common Core standards and their programs. Um, another area of focus is map data professional development um, to help our principals look at next steps using their data. Um, in elementary, another one is that we continue to provide differentiated assistance and professional development with SIPs because we, we want to make sure that we can have our students coming up with those foundational skills. And then, um, again, looking at that PDSA um, instructional coaching cycle with using, uh, utilizing our ELA and math coaches to also assist our sites and principals. Just a couple of highlights on the secondary, <laughs> twice, a <laughs> couple of options uh, on the secondary side that are a little bit different, uh, but still moving in the right direction. So one of those highlight pieces has been really our middle school principals working within their own PLC as well. So them going through and pulling apart quadrant data and how do we assist folks and what kind of level of feedback are we giving. Um, that is an alignment you'll see up there. What is the review and frequency of feedback that we actually offer teachers? And what does the quality look like with that feedback? Um, it came up in the Youth True survey. It's something that we've worked with in our site administration in terms of the level of frequency, but also the quality. What, what are we giving in feedback and how is that transforming the next steps and how are we supporting teachers? Um, and then the additional piece with that would be looking at the critical thinking band. Are our students the ones actually in those actions and completing the lift within the classroom and are we facilitating the learning versus really being that direct instruction piece. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any public speakers to this discussion item? Any questions or comments from the board? Uh, uh, wait, Trustee Hall. Um, so I know that, you know, our, our map data, we've, we've had a lot of conversations about attendance and I know that our map data doesn't necessarily correlate you know, with attendance issues, but I know, you know, we have individual performance that correlates with chronically absent students. So when you're looking at these improvement cycles, you know, how, how do you balance the breadth of data or the breadth of information that you get from the map data with the depth of information that you get from the individual factors that happen with our students? 
Well, a couple of things. So the, cor the correlates that you're talking about in relationship to being absent, it's generally if you're missing one day, you've actually lost that three days piece of instruction. So to make that up is incredibly challenging, a piece that is seen in this and that teachers have access to as well. And that's one of the dives that we were doing with our principals was past the point, even at a secondary level, you have five periods, you have six periods. So what does that look like for each teacher? Um, it actually gives us the opportunity to go in within quadrant focus as well to drive down all the way to the student. So you can see if the student has actually started, has the ability, has high achieving, but really isn't performing, and we can address that issue versus a student that we haven't moved into the other the band to be able to accelerate and get the growth that we're looking for. So you kind of dri drive down to the motivation factor, but it is it is intense work, and it gets to that place of saying, if you're really going down to make the difference and look at our students, are there some patterns? Absolutely. Um, but you do have some outlier pieces that we need to look at more specifically with students, which we can do within the system of the quadrants. Tara? I, I just wanted to ask about um, the fact that we were selected among the whole nation for the Khan Academy math, I forgot what it's called. Math Accelerate. Math Accelerate. We were, so we were selected among in the whole country as one of them. What are the things that we're doing with that? Because, you know, if we were selected, so we've got to be working on that level. Uh, there are numerous too. classrooms throughout the district that are using the Map Accelerator in their math. They're also, in, um, the teachers are engaged in professional development on the most effective ways to use the Map Accelerator. There was a training that just happened last week. Currently, we're working with um, Khan Academy and also MAP to go through and really dive down in our data to see how it's working. The big um, report and what we're really gonna find out is what, how much our students have accelerated comes in the springtime. So, okay, because so, the fact that we're connected and we were selected, how is it that we provide them we have to provide them data that we're actually doing, you know, we, we were selected for and we're whatever. Okay, so you know MAP, um, NWA yeah. MAP, um, partnered with Khan Academy um, in a relationship. So what happens is once the students take the MAP uh, test, the NWA MAP test, it identifies areas of growth for students. Mm -hmm. Those areas of growth are automatically fed to the Khan Academy program. Okay. And so when a student goes online, they're working on those identified areas of growth. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions, comments, board? Trustee Rusko? Is there a reason why our dependent charter schools were not included on this presentation? They were left off um, of the presentation. And what we have that, we do have that data and we could add it on for you. That would be great, I think. I mean, at the, as a board, I think last year, we requested that to happen moving forward. So I'm hopeful that in the future, this will not happen again. Um, under the test scores, I'm assuming that um, also includes our special ed students? Um, yes, it does. You know what would be really interesting, I think for me to know, is to really sort of take that population and then track their growth. So we're able to see really how they're actually doing and where we need to focus our attention with that population specifically. Yeah, I mean, they, if they could be put With the learning the center sites, we're currently looking at the student growth with uh, students with IEPs, their growth over the previous years versus the growth now that they're in the learning center with, with full inclusion. So that's something that we're currently looking at that we don't have the complete data for. Okay, thank you. Great question, Tresky or Roscoe. Um, no more questions coming? Hi, can we put up some slides that you that we went over showing some of the colors? Yes, what, which one? I don't know, there's a million of them. Um, go in, let's let, go back one. Oh, sorry, stop there for a second. Well, that's not, that's reading, I didn't want that one. Can you tell me what it means when something is in the white, like a quadrant is in the white? Like Valencia, for example? in second grade, it says 180 and it's not a color. What does that mean? Up 
at the very top. That yeah. That is actually growth percentile. But you see the whole first, yeah, the whole first line, there's like no colors at all. Like where it says Bradley 175.4. Oh, okay, so those are actually our, the RIT scores from the slides before. So how I was talking about the very first slides of data that we're showing that we, that map measures, that's the curriculum base that they actually, the curriculum scale that they actually use to measure growth. And before we compared fall to winter, so it's, I'm gonna actually back up a couple more slides. So it goes back to looking at it this way, mm -hmm. where we're looking at, you see the, um, the fall to winter growth. That's where they're seeing points. It's measured by points instead of um, like a percentile. So it's the amount of growth points that they received. Because that's what we use to help see that our students are making at least um, a year's growth or more. And then if I, this is a really hard, like I've seen these presentations for a couple years now on map, but it's still really hard for me to wrap my brain around. And I know you guys live it and breathe it every day, so you get it, but it's, and I'm a board member, I've been seeing this and it's still hard for me to get. So if I wanna know how our schools are doing against other schools in California, that is, is that, down at the bottom? I'm gonna actually, no, I'm gonna actually switch slides. Okay. And I'm gonna move us over to the percentile ranking. So I don't know if any, anyone else up here was kind of getting baffled, but if I'm baffled, then the general public is also baffled. So that's why I, I wanna get down to the nitty gritty. Absolutely. So if you're looking on this slide, um, again, you see that writ, that point scale that, we, that you had me go back to. Mm -hmm. That's that very first number at the top. And then it goes into the percentile rank. That is where they're actually being compared to schools nationally, the national norms. Okay. And is that just for growth or is that just for scores in general? For scores in general. Okay, that's good. Okay, so mm -hmm. they're actually at the 41st, um, per, like we're going back to Valencia, right? Sure. So they're at the 41st per percentile overall compared to all um, the schools that take it nationally, right? but then we look at their school conditional growth percentile and they're making growth at the 99th percentile compared to like schools. Okay, so that's positive. That is positive. That's excellent. We yeah. wanna be all about that number because that's all about the growth. So we used to, in our old like SBACs, or I don't even know what they were I called. I wanna know that it was seven minutes. Um, we used to be able to tell like the percentage of ELLs at certain schools which so that it, it made it gave us a context and how many special ed kids and how many you know we used to have that information in front of us so that it it sort of explained some things in this way of looking at the data I don't it's hard for me to know that for example okay so we can we have just like trustee Orozco asked we actually do divide up our data by subgroups and we actually have our principals look at it that way also so we can we can add that in a, um, in additional reports on map however just so this is not SPAC this is map so you won't see percentages though so you won't see so many percentages of students right unless we aggregated ourselves. I think the difference between MAP is that MAP, what we're doing is we're looking more at growth and SBAC, we're looking at much more on proficiency. So those are two, one is more interim, right? Because we do it multiple times a year and the SBAC, we do it only one time a year and it is basically the final note of where the students are. Um, and so um, we can definitely, um, we're actually in the process of working with a programmer out of um, the CUE, and so we definitely are interested in looking at MAP in a different way. Um, and once we have our, our data uploaded, we'll, we'll definitely can show it to you. Right now we do not have it uploaded okay. in the new I, system. But like I look at Amesti, for example, and I see their CGP is at 99, which is excellent, right? We were happy, very happy with that growth. But then you look up at the percentile rank and 
they're number three. It's like that is not that is not okay. Um, and so that's where this data gets a little baffling to me because when kids are starting so low that yes, it's fantastic that they're making growth, but then what what's what's our benchmark for schools like this? And I guess I, is that anywhere in this data that I'm looking at what the benchmark should be? Well, so, you think of it like the bell curve. So you always want to be on the 50th percentile. The, th the, the, reason, the reason why this slide is so important is because if you don't have CGP over the 61 that was mentioned, you're never going to, be cut, you're never going to increase that number. So most of our numbers across the board were ones prior. And so we're steadily increasing that. So for example, Calabasas is a great example of the the amount of growth that they've done and how that number has increased over time because it used to be a one and now you can see that they are gradually because of the great growth that they're doing that number is continuing to increase and so the goal is to have everyone across when it looks at the the regular percentile rank to be over 50 percent because then you're on the other side of the bell curve and so just to go back to this slide, why we actually have that 61 up there is because we know they'll, the, they'll actually start jumping the percentile ranks, right, quicker because we don't want them sitting at, sitting at three, right? But a MESTI, if they continue to have that 99 um, percentile in conditional growth, they're going to keep jumping up the percentiles. Great. So, so you feel satisfied with the growth that we're making as a district when you see this data. So that's... I feel satisfied with the elementary growth. We did the low performing block grant specifically focused on the middle school, which we started this year. So we still need to continue to push at the secondary level. And specifically at the middle school level, we need to do a better job of continuing to push our students. We've done a lot. What I am proud of is this highlights what we focus on we improve, right? We have focused on K-3 significantly and we see excellent growth K-3. We just this year started the parallel track at the middle school. So, you know, this was, these results were three months into that. So three months is not enough time to be able to see the initiatives moving forward. So I feel good. I, we, we could have, there's just so much data. If you, we did for leadership, the parallel slides of what this looked like in, 20, in 2020 and what it looked like in 2017. And it was so much red and orange before. And now we're seeing a whole bunch of the great colors. So for me, that's important because that means that our kids are making the growth and they're improving. Thank you. Okay. And next up, agenda item 9.2, first reading board policy and administrative regulation 5142.2, safe routes to school program and will be discussed by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yes, yeah, so I'll try to be quick. So as we were looking at the safe schools routes, there was a question that came up from, from board of if we had a board policy in terms of safe route to school and also active transportation. It was also one of the recommendations in the plan that you just approved. We looked, we didn't have any board policy on that. And so what you see here tonight, this is the first reading, so it's not for our approval. But what we do always work is we work through um, CSBA for their and GAMET for their administrative regulations and their board policies. I just want to highlight um, that this parallels significantly the plan that you just heard about. So it talks about um, educational activities and making sure that we're focusing on those educational activities. It talks about encouragement strategies. So you, t you heard about um, walk to school day, bike to school day, and so that is in there. Um, there is also a section about crossing guards and partnering with law enforcement and traffic laws and making sure that um, people are following those laws within our schools. 
Um, and then um, lastly, it just talks about working with um, local government agencies and looking to reduce um, hazards. And so all of it really aligns with the next steps that you heard. Um, as with all board policies, um, I encourage you to look at it um, between now and the next board meeting or now um, is the time that you can provide me feedback on it. If there are certain things that you would like to choose um, to, to shift, um, generally what we do is we use CASBO and GAMET because they've, we, that doesn't require us to use any of our own legal counsel because it's already been vetted in its form. Um, but we did, um, we did personalize it to us. So I encourage board to reach out to me if they have some changes they would like to see made before the next um, board meeting. Thank you very much. Any public speakers to this discussion item? Any questions or comments from the board? Okay. A quick one. Oh, Trustee Hall. Just out of curiosity, are there any financial impacts to the district for these projects? So, no. So we, we have dedicated ourselves, and there was a mention of a letter in which I wrote of, in support of the Lee Trails. Um, so there is constant um, joint collaboration to try to get grants. Um, one thing that, which is important, and Joe has been very involved in it, is as we're doing, um, McQuitty is a perfect example. We actually use their study as we redid McQuitty so that we, as we were already going to do something, we coupled that. Um, and so we're just doing a synergy of funding. Thank you very much. Next, um, consent agenda on item 10, consent items are routine items coming before the board. Any public speakers to the consent agenda? Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? Trustee Holm? Um, yeah, I'd like to defer 10.5. 10.5. Any other agenda items wishing to be pulled? All right, can you just go ahead and get a motion for the um, agenda items except 10.5? Is there a motion? Of approval. A second. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Agenda item 10.5, approval of architect agreement for PVUSD Towers Modernization 2020. All right, uh, good evening uh, once again. Uh, this item is in regards to uh, part of the district um, purchasing the property where we house our district office. And this was completed back in 2018, uh, at the end of 2018. Um, we were successful uh, with board support and um, superintendent uh, support in acquiring the property for approximately $10.4 million. Uh, within that, when we were directed by the board to do various assessments and analysis of the property, we, um, through our partnership and our architect, we uncovered that there was um, the envelope of the building, uh, roofing, our HVAC units, and also a safety concern with the seismic um, upgrade of the building. Uh, was required and so within that one of the directions that I was given is to make sure that when we do purchase this property in the negotiation process that we make sure that the purchase price is either cost neutral or cost benefit to the district and so with that being said we were able to have a uh, set aside budget from our financing of approximately 5.6 million dollars and that budget is what we uh, is presented this evening for the architect agreement to move forward with HVAC, roof, uh, seismic, and then we also talked about um, the, uh, um, the other components when it regards to lighting and safety and building envelope as a whole. And so we took that into consideration as well. And so all of that uh, was lumped into the assessments and the negotiation process with the, the prior ownership and with our legal team and our consultants at that point in time. And so uh, we are able to have 5.6 million part of our financing in the COP, our certificate of participation, to have that set aside for deferred maintenance of the building. And those are the items that we are, uh, would like to move forward with. And that was, um, was provided back in 2018 as we move forward through that. Um, 
The, uh, the appraisal also took into consideration a negotiation process just to remind the board. We were also able to reduce the asking price because that there was some needs that needed to be taken care of within the building. And so that's where we were able to get the purchase price at 10.4 million. And so this is uh, specifically to HVAC, lighting, air, drainage, roof repairs, uh, elevator uh, modernization, and we also have faulty doors and then some safety issues within the building. Um, so this contract allows our architect to now um, proceed with designs of uh, the modernization of the property um, to meet the, address the safety and issues raised in the analysis back in 2018. Any other discussion? Or another, oh, I'm sorry. Um, one, like how much of the project is for the seismic retrofit? Oh, I, I had that answer, Joe, so I have it right here. So okay. um, the board can um, look at it if they want. It's on the letter that says Towers 2020 Modernization. It's on the second page for you. So the seismic is 1.1 million, 1.18. Um, the existing building systems, which is the HVAC, the power, the plumbing, and the roofing is 1.7 million. Um, fire alarm is 180,000. Um, I want to note that the, the floor improvements in the front is very much, um, we have hundreds of employees which do work down at the district office. One of their main concerns is safety because as we had mentioned when we purchased the building there, I can't remember how many entries there were, 24. So there are 24 ways for people to get in the building, none of them secure. Um, and then if anyone who first goes into the district office will know that it's hard to know where to go because the um, the registration or the um, the person that um, says hello to everyone um, is on the fourth floor and so that is just 260. I will say that by doing this one we knew we were going to have to do this so it drove down the price significantly um, but also by doing this we will have a lot less deferred maintenance costs because we have on a weekly basis we when it rains it literally rains in the building and we probably have someone out to fix the um, elevator at least twice a month um, with people getting stuck in the elevator um, so they are all things that we need to do um, and, um, and we have had to, um, you know, we, just like in my office, you go in my office and you will see two fans and a heater because the heating and air conditioning, um, doesn't work. Um, and so, um, this would allow us to do that. And when we did the evaluation, drove down the price from their original high price down to a point where we pay less for the building um, now than when we were paying rent. I just have a, a couple more, and that's one, you know, my own personal experience with roofs, you know, for my own house, it's like I had to defer, you know, some minor repairs on my roof for a few years, and then I had to actually completely replace the roof because I didn't fix it when it was a small problem. Is it fair to assume that if we don't deal with the roof problems as they are now, that that cost if we waited a year or two, that that cost would increase in Correct. a similar and manner? Correct. And there are sections of the roof that are in decent condition, in fair condition, and there are sections of the roof where there's actually holes in the roof. And um, n prior to acquiring the property, it was the landlord's responsibility. But once the district acquired the property and we we're purchasing it, now we need to protect our property, our physical asset. And so there are sections of the roof that need to be completely replaced and install new roofs. Okay. And my, my other question is, is I know we tend to think about the district office as an administrative building, but what other programs and, and groups are in that building? We have our various uh, school district-wide uh, committees from our uh, DLAC. We have professional development for our principals and for our teachers, and we also have classified staff. We have union leadership meetings in the district administration office. Um, it's also an opportunity for student services and their first point of engagement with our new enrollment or new students or families coming into our community. Um, Isn't there a school in there? 
There's also Pacific Coast Charter in Pacific a Coast Charter uh, of there. the facility. Yeah, that's um, what I thought. But Pacific it has Charter. numerous points of service in our SELPA department, our adult, adult education. education. Adult uh, education. So there's numerous factors and services <laughs> within the building. Um, and I think the importance of having, um, as our superintendent mentioned, the reception relocated to the first floor will also help in customer service and serving our, our parents and our community and uh, making sure that they're directed where they need to be um, served more efficiently. Any other questions or comments? Trustee DeSorpa. So Joe, the money that is um, going to be used to repair the towers came from a mortgage that we took out when we bought the property, correct? Correct. That's the best. So that's the conditions of participation. Correct. Essentially, the mortgage that the district holds on behalf of the towers. So it's not coming out of the general fund. It's not money that could be spent on anything else. Correct. And it's it was taken as part of the financing as a mortgage to take on the deferred maintenance that we were aware of in the front end of the negotiation purchasing process uh, to do that and so it's included in that and that also reduced the cost of the purchase price and it also allowed us to continue acquiring the property have this set aside budget for deferred maintenance and still be at a cost savings for the district and, so and despite the added you know five million dollars or whatever for the maintenance of the building or the deferred maintenance how much are, will the district save over the long run by purchasing the towers? Let me give you the... Because um, I remember us talking about this in depth, but I can't me, remember the actual let me dollar pull that amount. that up here. And the... Over the 30 years, and this was presented back in the uh, end of 2018, over 30 years, the estimated cost savings is $28.6 million from going from rent, annual rent, of approximately 1.3 million annually to shifting into as a mortgage and, and buying the property. Wait. Wait. Is there a mortgage cost that we pay that we're gonna be paying for a while, obviously, right? Actually, we are looking, we had it structured so that it was approximately 16 years that we would break even. So the cost savings over 30 year period, the, those years and those 30 years of the 28 million is paying off the property in approximately 16 years. And that was, that's where we get the savings over 30 years. Okay. Oh, cause we're paying it off. Any, any other questions or comments? Maria, Trustee Acosta? Um, well, before we go ahead to a vote, I know I wasn't here when the towers were purchased. I believe that we shouldn't have bought the towers, in my opinion, and I know a lot of people in the city of Watsonville knew this was gonna happen. And in 1989, we had a big earthquake. After that earthquake, you know, the hospital was red tagged for a while. And so I just wanted to bring that up. Also another thing too, Coralitos Creek floods. And if you look at the land, you know, next to our neighbors, we're, you know, in a floodplain, so we're, you know, we could flood. And um, I, I never would have voted for the, the towers to be bought. I think a lot of other places and spots have, could have been purchased. So I will be voting no. So if there's a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. A second. I'll second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Motion passes. All right. So, um, closed session items. Uh, item 12, closed session. Action report on closed session. For closed session item 2.2. .2. Oh. Yes. Sorry, I was getting, looking at the vote in here. Um, so the board approved um, a, a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the 1920 school year and the fall semester of the 2021 school year with placement at another school in the district on a strict behavior contract for student number 1920-014 with a 502 vote. 
Um, the board also approve the recommendation of the district administration for a full expulsion of the remainder of the 1920 school year and the fall semester of the 2021 school year with placement at another school outside of the district on a strict behavior contract for student number 1920013 uh, with a 502 vote. Regarding um, closed session item 2.2, .2, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on February 26, 2020 with 14 and six additional action items. Uh, I move to approve. <laughs> awesome. Second. Second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And for closed session item 2.3, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on February 26, 2020, with four and 11 additional action items. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 And Any for opposed? No. I'm sorry, mine was a aye. <laughs> so it's a port or opposed? In support. No, there's no okay. opposition. <laughs> And then during closed session, as per resolution 1920-28, the PVUSD Governing Board of Trustees voted 502 on the non-reelection of certain probationary certificated employees for the following employees: 8190, 8198, 8765, 2700, 8209, 8737, 8843. And during closed session, as per resolution 192027, the PUESD Governing Board of Trustees voted 502 on the possible reassignment or release for certain certificated management employees for the following 11 employees 3348, 1220, 1223, 1273, 6974, 2423, 2425, 59, or 4950. 2996, 3914, and 6119. Thank you very much. Our, up, our next board meeting is scheduled for March 11th at the City Council Chambers. Hey, Danny, if oh. I may, before you adjourn on that item, sorry. I have one last request. I'm sorry. Um, if I could ask the Agenda Setting Committee to consider bringing an agenda item back um, on the cost saving measures that as a district we're looking to and we plan to look to in the future, including what we have agreed as part of the labor management initiative as a team, as a district, as far as saving money to make sure that we're able to allocate additional funds to the negotiating table. So, and we can bring